Welcome to the 31st meeting of the 2018 um, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move on to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they can affect the broadcasting system. We first of all have apologies to one of our members, uh, Finlay Carson, and uh, we'll move on to um, the first item on the agenda, agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four in private. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yes, yes. Okay. Right, we're agreed. The second item on the agenda is to invite Rhoda Grant, who's joining the committee, also welcome Rhoda Grant to the committee for the first time today, to declare any relevant interests. I don't think any of my registered interests are relevant, but I'm a member of Unison, the trade union, and a member of the co-op party, both who have a record in environmental issues. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So, welcome Rhoda to the committee, and I want to thank her predecessor, Alec Rowley, for his contribution to the committee's work. I'm sure everyone joins me in that. Right, the third item in the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill. This is the third of the committee's evidence sessions um, with stakeholders, and we're going to hear from two panels today on behaviour change and on governance. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our first panel this morning. We'll look at the behaviour change required to achieve targets set out in the bill. So joining us today are uh, Shane Donnellan, the Senior Behaviour Change Specialist at ChangeWorks, welcome. Dr Rachel Howell, Lecturer in Sustainable Development, School of Social and Political Science at the University of Edinburgh. Mary Sweetland, the Chair of Eco Congregation Scotland. And Jamie Stewart, Policy Officer with Citizens Advice Scotland. So welcome to you all. And um, we're going to go straight on to questions. My first question from John Scott. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning and welcome to you all. Um, so, my question is, how well has the Scottish Government's approach to encouraging low carbon behaviour change, including through the Climate Change Plan, worked so far? And are there examples or success stories from other policy areas which you think were worth telling us about or could be adopted? It's a question for all of you. So just indicate to me if you want to... Um... Um, I think uh, the question on whether it has worked so far kind of comes back to how how much behaviour has been included in policy in the first place. Um, so I think within the climate change plan, um, there was some criticism that maybe behaviour hadn't been front and centre, that it had been kind of included somewhat as an add-on. Um, so when it isn't the kind of driving force behind some of the policy, it can be difficult to say exactly how it has worked or hasn't. I think there have been some really good examples of it being front and centre. Um, through some of the intermediaries, there have been some work with Scottish Water, um, through EST, I know they've done a kind of a pilot to try and change behaviour. And these, there have been kind of some learnings and successes in terms of, of reducing energy use and making people more aware. But in the greater scheme of things, I suppose, maybe there hasn't been as much. Um, Eco Congregation Scotland has been working on this for the last eight or nine years, I think, um, supporting congregations about bringing about change and trying to encourage them to look after uh, God's earth. And we've had a lot of success within the different uh, congregations that are part of it on recycling, looking at energy in the churches and things. We won an award um, from the European uh, Churches Environmental Network for a project that was done in Mid Argyle that we looked at all the churches that were there and saw what um, alternative energy sources they could be using to actually heat uh, the, them rather than oil. Um, but the while there's the agenda as well known at the different behaviours that need to be taken forward, there's always a, a, a different way of how they can do this, a spin effect. I heard the other week about um, Orkney, where there is no gas, 
where instead of being pushed to put in renewables, uh, air source heat pumps, um, or to put, redo their housing, they were actually installed an oil boiler um, to, to burn, to reduce their um, carbon use within their house. Now, in Orkney, you know all the energy there is from renewables, but because if they feed, uh, use only electricity within their homes, they can, still can't get their uh, certification above a band C for energy um, efficiency in their house, because the way the system is set up, energy, uh, electricity is highly um, weighted in the um, calculations. I live in a passive house and I can achieve an A, but it still asks in the passive house certification whether you've got a boiler or not and have you got gas. I don't have any of that. It's great when the people come on the phone trying to sell you bass and you say, don't have a boiler. But, you know, so it's the way that it's the commercial side have adapted things, trying to tick a box to say they've achieved it, but actually not delivering the move to uh, zero um, carbon. Um, I think what we see is that in terms of energy saving behaviours, there have been some really successful trials and the Scottish Government has quite a good platform uh, for, for looking at how those trials work and what the barriers uh, might be for, for householders. Um, but across the board, there isn't a general rec recognition amongst households and Scottish households that energy saving behaviour is something they really need to be doing. Um, it's, not, it's not high up their, their agendas. I think there's growing recognition and recent surveys have shown this, that people are more aware that uh, climate change uh, action has to happen now. So we, we surveyed people in 2017, uh, which was a representative sample, and 73% of uh, people surveyed said that action needs to be taken now. But they still uh, perceived recycling and reducing waste as being uh, the best thing that they could do to, to save energy. So I think we've seen uh, small pockets of, of success stories where households are, are really targeted, they're given um, advice on how to save energy. They might be given free measures. But again, it, it's pockets of success. And I think it's looking at how we try to expand that so that it's effective across, across the nation. Rachel Hill. Um, yes, I think two of the um, really good examples of where policy has changed behaviour will be recycling and also the plastic bag tax. And it's interesting to think about why that has worked. With recycling, it's all about making it very easy. So, you know, people no longer have to get in a car and take things to a big bank at a uh, car park of a supermarket. It's now very easy, curbside recycling. And because it's easy and because it's noticeable, people are putting boxes or whatever out in front of their house, that has changed social norms. Uh, unfortunately, it has had this slightly negative effect that people then feel they're doing their bit and that recycling is a big part. Recycling is very important. But um, in, in climate change terms, it's a relatively uh, small behaviour change. The plastic bag tax, again, has changed norms, and that's worked because it is such an easy behaviour to change. Um, putting a price on something which previously was free is, ex again, extremely noticeable, and it's very, very simple to change it. There's not really anything to be annoyed about. Um, but in terms of some of the other bigger areas for change, um, transport, for example, emissions have not decreased since we started on this. Transport is still a really big problem. However, I was very interested to discover from an excellent uh, master's dissertation, which I looked at, that was submitted this summer, that Edinburgh itself has a, a very well-kept secret that it is um, the city with the largest proportion of public transport users and lowest proportion of private car drivers outside of London in the UK. Now, why is that? That isn't so much because a lot of uh, integrated policy making, it's for a whole lot of structural factors, and it does come down to structures. So this is about us having uh, an excellent uh, bus service run by a local authority, which is very noticeably cheaper than most other bus services. It's about the density at which people live, which makes it very difficult to own uh, certainly two cars, and in some places one car, there aren't places to put cars. Uh, it's a very walkable city as well. 
And I think we need to be looking more, I mean, we'll come on to this later, I'm sure, but we need to be looking more at um, how structures change behaviour and not just about the kind of public engagement policies that we are often part of the behaviour change agenda. Thank you. Um, so it may be something to do with the size of it, Edinburgh, I think. I've often thought that, that it's big enough to be a city, yet it's, it's big enough to be... It's also a town, too. It has that feel about it, that intimate feel about it. And there may actually be a, an optimum size of towns and cities in the future. If you see what I'm saying. Sorry. Possibly a lot of a lot of the others that have uh, high rates of uh, active travel and public transport and so on are also relatively small, Oxford, Cambridge, York, and so on. But London is the prime example. No bigger city, and yet it has the lowest rates. So, I think it actually can be done in different ways in most sizes of city. But yeah, there might be something to do with uh, density of living as much as uh, size of city. Oh, fascinating. Well, which need, leads me nicely to my next question to ask the panel if we can provide examples of international best practice in terms of achieving low carbon behaviour change and what can Scotland perhaps learn from that in a desktop way or other ways? I think, again, um, I'd like to draw on examples of um, cities particularly in the Netherlands, where cycling is completely the norm. And again, it's all about infrastructure. How much that has to do with deliberate policy and how much to do with how um, the cities have simply developed. And also, as you say, geography, it is indeed flat. Um, which, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's impossible to overcome things like that. You know, cycling is just one example of a low carbon transport behavior. Um, but... It's, I really do think we need to be looking at places where the structures have made a big difference to behaviour. Uh, in 10 years of research on this, I've done a lot of research about the kind of the behaviour change agenda in terms of persuasion and values and all those kind of things which are the individual factors in the ISM model. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that although the individual factors kind of need to be right so that they don't inhibit change, it's the structural uh, factors, the, the S and the M factors in your ISM model that the government uses, um, that are the ones that actually do most to promote positive change. Uh, and, and my whole research agenda is changing more towards looking at structural factors because of that, because I've kind of given up on the hope that we're going to achieve huge strides that we need to make through focusing mostly on the individual factors and on persuasion and small nudges which encourage people to um, make choices to change their behaviour. Jamie Stewart. I think, um, to slightly echo what Rachel was saying, uh, if we look at one example, which is the take-up of electric vehicles in, in Norway. So there's a, there's a tax incentive um, on electric vehicles, which uh, is, is encouraging people to buy them. But you've then also got the, the sort of that structural infrastructure, so there's a good charging network. And we're seeing the results that it might not be exactly uh, replicable in Scotland, um, but we now have more uh, electric vehicle car sales than, than diesel or petrol in Norway. So that, that kind of, it's become almost the social norm, but I think it's a result of having that, that structural support, support there. And presumably consistency of, of that support as well, because I, I know that certainly in London, they had a, an incentivised, you know, having an electric vehicle because it was very cheap to charge them and then the contract completely changed and it's a new provider and suddenly it's more expensive, which you know, so has to be consistent, would you agree? I think, uh, yeah, because consistency is important. Um, certainly in something like tax incentives, um, so we've seen in the UK the, the grants for <clears throat> low carbon vehicles, electric vehicles and ultra low emission vehicles has, has reduced slightly. So whether a grant can be guaranteed forever is, is one thing, but I think um, having some sort of consistency is important for, for households and, and consumers to, to have confidence in a system, yeah. Right, we have some, some other questions around this theme. First from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting you're talking really about system change, really, to, to tackle climate change. And it's difficult to unpack the different elements, but in terms of pricing and, and financing then, I mean... How effective would a measure such as free public transport be within within cities? Um, and are, are there complexities around 
making things free and then potentially consumption increasing or are there, are there good approaches of where you've got a system that works in terms of um, decarbonizing transport but also uh, you know providing effective service that, that's competitive with with use of the private car or... I think you've hit on a really important thing um, price and finance and costs are hugely important to people and they tend to be what people see how will this affect me what will this um, affect my pocket or my family's income um, it's it, it, it is kind of the single biggest factor in terms of so many things uh, transport uh, getting um, retrofits on your house upgrading the efficiency of your property um, it's it, you know it's admirable when people say wish to uh, cut down on domestic flights but when a flight to London is maybe a third of the price as the train it's very difficult to expect people to actually make that change. They can have the best will in the world, but ultimately that's a lot of money that they're depriving themselves for, for kind of one simple action. Um, th there's no, I don't think, um, straightforward formula as to what an incentive should be, or, you know, and if, if, as you say, you have free transport, people could then kind of abuse it or it becomes something that people take for granted. Um, th th I'm just kind of, uh, assuming that could be kind of one side effect. I think there needs to be consumer research into any kind of incentivization. Um, but it, unfortunately, it is one of the biggest motivators is it's either cost or what people are getting kind of and, and, and the financial value that they attribute to that. Yeah. I think. James Stewart. I think it's obviously finance is, is a really key factor as well. And if, if say public transport in Edinburgh was free, I think we'd see the, the use of it increase. But there are also, I think there are other factors that might almost be more important. So how often are the buses, are they going in the right places? Uh, are they going to, you know, GP, um, GP um, surgeries? Are they going to hospitals? Are they going to schools? So I think it's the sort of uh, how useful the services is, is really important as well and especially in rural areas where we see a lack of bus services. Stuart Stevenson. Um, uh, I think also with something like public transport you need to look not only at whether uh, making it free or very much cheaper is going to work but also the other side what's the alternative that people might choose the private car for example and um, you, you've got to work on both sides of that equation so I think uh, to encourage people onto buses is not just about the price and the ease of the buses although I think the ease of the use is very very important as well as the price you've also got to make it more expensive and less attractive to, to use a car I think the in terms of your question about whether there might be potential drawbacks um, I think you've got to be very careful about a very consistent policy because if you hook people into behaviors using the financial motive um, you, you can crowd out some other motives and then if the financial motive isn't there it changes people's reaction so for example at the University of Edinburgh you get 50p off every time you buy coffee if you take a keep cup what worries me is if people are also using coffee houses near the university that don't offer that do they have they actually become um, sort of hooked into the idea that uh, they ought to get money off if they're using a keep cup and therefore if, if that isn't offered why should they have the um, the inconvenience of carrying that cup which you know then needs to be cleaned out and so on so I think you've got to be very careful that it's a consistent incentive and that you know that you can keep it up for quite a while if you're going to go with the financial incentives Stuart Stevenson um, we're talking about individual behavior and I want to make it very personal I live in a remote rural area. Uh, we burn 4,000 litres of oil a year. It was 6,000 until the government put uh, 400 millimetres in our loft and that cut 2,000 litres off. That's great. It's quite an old boiler. If we replaced it with a new oil boiler, uh, that would cut our consumption by about 15%, so uh, about 25%, uh, uh, so that's 1,000 litres. Um, that's about £600 a year at the moment. Um, it costs 2000 so you get your money back in about three years. However, we'd like to go air source heat pump. That's fifteen to £20,000. Um, it, would, uh, it would give us a 10-year payback. But fundamentally, 
Um, the service engineer for the oil boil is 15 minutes drive away. The service engineer for the air source heat pump is two and a half hours drive away. Why would I not continue to burn oil? Mary Sweetland. Because you have a commitment to reduce your carbon footprint rather than the funding on it. It is an, an issue. There was a big gear up in Scotland for companies that would support air source heat pumps when there was incentives. That demand didn't develop because of the costs and therefore they've gone out of business. And you have great farmers in particular have difficulty in getting um, engineers to come. I know my, my cousin has an air source heat pump and it broke down because somebody had installed it poorly. So it's about making sure that the industry is prepared and ready to go and you actually support them and, and gear them up to do it. And the price for air source heat pumps has dropped. Um, it's, but, worth, it's worth saying my wife has the money. It's the engineer <laughs> that's the reason she's yeah. not doing it. Yeah, I mean, it was the Because like, she's similarly got experience of neighbours. It's um, the setup for, in, for a car, uh, um, putting in an electric car point, plug points in um, Orkney. They were actually sending someone up from Cheltenham to go and install the um, electric point rather than. There's now somebody goes from Stirling. So somebody was going to drive all that way up in a diesel van. So it, it's that shift that people really want to do it and incentivise that. You forgive me, we're trying to explore here, you know, we understand the problem and I think we've well defined it, but what can the government do to move my wife and others to that different position? Um, how do we do that? Would like to come in before we move on? Shane Donnelly. Do just briefly, um, I think it was mentioned already, you know, there's obviously a need for kind of a bottom up and a top down approach, both regulation as long, uh, along with some of the, the more softest of the public engagement. But right now, the, what is missing, so, so say in your situation, you're motivated to, but you know, it, the, the cost benefits just aren't, aren't weighing up. One of the things that is kind of mis missing is, is the responsibility actually it's it's not it shouldn't be up to you in a, in, a, in a sense don't don't take me out of context but you've a responsibility as should everyone in Scotland some of the policies are saying that the the changes the lifestyle changes in the next couple of years are going to affect everyone in Scotland but if that is kind of genuinely believed in we need to get people buying that message actually this sits with you and yourself and myself that we all need to actually take bigger changes it's not just um, LED light bulbs anymore. That isn't going to get us to the 2050 targets, that there is actually a need for investment. So, and then that goes hand in hand with the systemic approach support. Do, for, do forgive me, I'm really looking at rural versus urban. I mean, I wouldn't own a car if I lived in Edinburgh. Yeah. I'm two hours walk away from the nearest bus stop. And current generations of electric cars don't get me to Aberdeen and back with one charge. What am I going to do? We have a very short supplementary from Richard Lyle before we move on to Claudia Beamish. Dr Edgar Howell mentioned Holland. Uh, my mother-in-law was Dutch. I first went there in 1973 and subsequently I visited quite a lot. Holland's transport system is fantastic and very cheap. So, when you're talking about buses, a bus comes along every five, ten minutes. So, in Scotland, should we have a more reliable bus service and should we promote park and ride more, because you can buy some park and ride areas and they're just empty. Anyone like to answer that? Yeah, Mary Sweetland. This is a park and ride at Ingolston. It's not empty. It's full. And there's no charging places available. They're always filled up for the electric cars. So, I mean, it may be some places. Maybe the original, the location of the park and ride is what's the problem. But there are some that are very well used. I, I certainly agree with the fact that we need a, a cheap and reliable bus service. I think if you look at some of the targets for emission reduction from the transport sector, we are looking at possibly using electric vehicles or, or some hydrogen vehicles. But again, the costs of them are, are prohibitive at the moment. But there's also a big section of society who don't uh, can't afford private transport at the moment. So I think you know, they need to be supported and, and having a good and reliable bus service, I think, is, is really an essential thing to do. 
Rachel Hale. Yes, I think a, a, a reliable and affordable bus service is really important and I, I want to come back again and just suggest other measures to make using the car less um, uh, uh, convenient and cheap as well so and and this you can we can look at the co-benefits one of the things that's happening in Edinburgh is there are more and more schemes which uh, where the roads close to uh, schools are closed at pick up and drop off time for children and uh, parents and children are behind that because of concerns about air pollution uh, I think that could be rolled out. That could be one of the things whereby we sort of say, this needs to be joined up. This is not just about air pollution right by the school gates. Those children, uh, people, children live on the streets near schools and you could actually have um, driving bans at particular times in whole areas rather than individual streets. Um, you, we can close more streets to private vehicles and make them places where only uh, cyclists, walkers, taxis and buses can go. Just before we move on to Claudia Beamish, we, we heard from um, two experts in Sweden last week, and they made the point that you're never going to be able to, in rural areas, have the kind of bus services that you're talking about. It's just not going to happen. They're very radial going into our cities, certainly where I come from, for Stuart comes from, for other you know, Rhoda Grants and Highlands and Islands MSP. You know, so you're going to have to incentivise the, the cars, are, electric cars are, are the way forward. So could you see a situation where you have to have almost a kind of um, uh, dual policy, something incentivisation for, for electric vehicles in rural areas, but then more structural stuff happening in, in, in urban centres as well? Is that something... Absolutely, yes. And we've heard from the First Minister there's going to be a phase out of uh, fossil fueled cars by 2032. So, you know, there's, there's going to have to be some kind of help for people who, you know, we're going to have to set up the charging infrastructure for people who live in rural areas. Um, but it will become the norm and we will start to see that whole system setting up, or we will have to see that system setting up. So. Um, yeah, we've got to treat rural areas and urban areas differently. Uh, and so in answer to the question slightly earlier, I think um, the government has got to bring out, it's got to think strategically about very large scale rollouts of structural changes, but it's got to target where they're going to work first. So air source heat, or air source heat pumps, even though they're best to replace oil boilers, might not be best to sort of target at very rural areas where the engineers are very long distance, perhaps target some of the smaller towns that are close to those rural areas and so that the network of engineers starts spreading out and then you target the most rural areas once the engineers and so on are in place. Does that not disadvantage rural areas that they're not getting the opportunity to, 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 to access the new technologies because of this and you have a situation where it is yet again more expensive to live in a rural area. We're almost being penalised for, for populating those. So we have this drive for people to live in the cities because they've got better bus services, they've got access to all this new technology, cheaper fuel bills, exactly. It is. I'm afraid there's no perfect policy here. Um, I think what we need to, to work out is where do we have to get to? What's, what, are we, what are we trying to avoid? Because we've always got to keep in mind all policies are going to have some downsides for some people. But what's the biggest downside? The biggest downside is if we don't tackle climate change. That is going to create a, a world in which we just, you know, an, an inhospitable world. So we've got to do the next best thing that we can do to avoid that huge problem, rather than say, well, we can't do this, that or the other because, you know, it's not perfect. We can't allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good or the good enough. But, um Claudia Bimish. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, just as a quick, very quick supplementary to that, would the um, panel agree that one of the issues is the development of skills um, for smaller towns, for, for rural areas, so that um, rural dwellers such as myself and, and Stuart, who I, I hold my hand up in shame and say I'm, I'm another one who has um, an oil boiler and has kept wanting to change and even on my salary has sort of wondered and, and I just say that so is skills one of the areas you know in everywhere from my mouth to Orkney you know that we should be developing there are a lot of nods of heads so just to hear from yourself <laughs> I think skills and, and having the uh, appropriate resources to provide support services to rural areas is, is really important. If you look at the smart meter rollout as an example, um, that's generally at the moment being focused on, on urban areas. 
and we know that smart meters will, will bring lots of advantages um, in terms of people being more aware of their energy use, um, but also to facilitate lots of different smart technologies. And we see that the rollout's kind of quite slow in rural areas. And Installed tomorrow, okay. <laughs> because of a phone call to me. I hope anyway, it works. Sorry. <laughs> um, but we, you know, it's one. It's always a. It's always going to be a difficult issue when you have isolated areas. But ensuring that the companies, or whether it's companies or, or government support programs, are, are well resourced enough to make sure that people in in rural and remote communities have have that advice and support is is really important. Mary. Sorry, through the convener. Sorry. Carry on. Uh, it was just that Mary was going to come in on that, if that's... I, I was um, pausing. As yeah. an inhabitant of a rural village 22 miles from Glasgow, who does not have super-fast broadband yet, um, in part of the National Park uh, for Loch Lomond and Trossex, I mean, the, the infrastructure is an issue, and it's reliability, it's engineers. I have an electric car. But how often do I go to a rapid charger and discover it's not working? So they're installed, but the engineers aren't in place to keep them up to date. And if there's a storm, called, like Ali, suddenly they go off because they're not getting the broadband signal. So it, it's things like that, I think, from an, a skills perspective, that we really need to make sure if we're developing a circular economy, which we need to do, to meet the targets, we've got to become more thrifty, which is a good old Scottish word. Um, and actually, the expanding growth in the economy has got to move to environmental topics rather than, you know, um, some of the big commercial. One of the things that we had a meeting, going back to the international best practice, climate justice is a major concern for the churches um, because it's the people, the communities who are suffering most, who have done least to increase their carbon use. And they want Scotland to share the knowledge and experience they have, rather than to sell it to them for profit. So we've got examples of solar ovens in Bolivia, how solar panels work, wind and things. So the developing world are looking for Scotland, and we have been doing some superb work on that in sharing the skill sets that we have, but we need to change industry to developing. When I built my passive house, there were very few people around that knew how to build a passive house, and they only knew single skill sets. So a joiner and an electrician you were waiting about, it's a big change within the building sector that we need to bring about. Thank you, thank you, convener. Um, could I just um, follow up on the international issue with you, Mary, before I come to my, um, my, my own uh, question, which I'll ask the whole panel. I was very interested in your um, written submission that, that um, you said that, um, uh, and I quote from Eco Congregations, one of the principal drivers of climate action in churches is the impact of stories from around the world. Now, those stories, as I understand it, are from places where the impacts of climate change are happening. And I wonder the degree to which you think it's appropriate or useful for beyond the churches, um, for those stories to be told in terms of um, the effect they can have on us changing our behaviour in the developed world. I, I think it's essential. You see it with, with disaster and emergency committee. I mean, the churches work with um, Christian Aid, SCIAF, Tier Fund, all of the big charities, and a key part of ours is supporting international um, development. That's one of the roles, if you are a, a, an eco-congregation, that you take that responsibility for um, that development. But technology is great. We can actually share these stories. They can have an impact. And we are all take, suffering, you know, not suffering, enjoying the plastics impact of David Attenborough. So we can use the media to communicate that more, to show what's happening and share that, that knowledge and experience and what we can do. And it's actually the millennial generation that are having the biggest impact. Churches, we tend to have the people who are responsible for um, bringing about the use of, of carbon use, high use. And there, if you, you know, they say, we always talked about it's for your grandchildren that you need to make a change now. But now they're actually beginning to think, oh, it might actually be in our generation that we see the impact of climate change on Scotland. 
And, and uh, for, for all the panel, could I ask you, um, in terms of the climate change plan, which Scottish Government has developed and we've um, scrutinised in this committee, um, uh, as you may know, I'm sure you do, it focuses on seven key sectors. Just for the, for the record, I'll highlight what those are. They're electricity, buildings, transport, industry, waste, land use change, forestry and agriculture. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering the degree to which um, you think, well, it's going to be updated to reflect the bill's new emissions reduction tra trajectory, if I can say the word, out to 2050. But are there particular sectors there um, or indeed additional sectors, such as was raised with us by um, the Swedish um, evidence last week, um, which where fashion and um, mobile phones not being able to be reused because they're glued together and the plastic is corrupted. Um, are there particular sectors that you think it's important to develop um, further behaviour change in? And if so, which are they and what can be done? So out of any of those sectors, perhaps ones that you have the most knowledge and experience of, or the heaviest emitters, or however you wanted to take the question. Dear Mr. Chair. I think, um, you know, people have been highlighting the importance of emissions reductions from the residential sector. Um, so I think a third of our current emissions come from the residential sector. Um, so there is a, there's an opportunity there to try and reduce that. I think coming back to my earlier point, the problem is that households don't associate the energy that they use in their home with having a big contribution to, to overall emissions. Um, I think people to some extent feel that what they do in their home is, is tokenistic. Um, so I think we need to either provide people with, with more information and education to make them realise that you know, something uh, like reducing uh, their, their heating, you know, their, their thermostat can actually have quite a big impact if people across the, across the country do it. And that, again, might relate back to um, having uh, some sort of awareness raising campaign and making uh, things really aspirational for people rather than being told you have to turn your thermostat down, um, making them or helping them to, to realise that they can actually have a positive impact. I think it's important to focus on, on the positives um, and you know that will, that if they have a small action, it can actually facilitate change um, and a reduction in emissions. Um, I'll just chip in, and I'll try not to cover anything Jamie's already said. But um, one of the other sectors, buildings, um, obviously huge, huge importance has kind of been described as the low-hanging fruit, and there's been there has been a huge amount of progress made. The Scottish Government have the great uh, internal wall insulation programme has been running for many years um, to upgrade existing stock. Um, but if, if, if that is happening completely um, in isolation of any behavioural advice, so someone's house becomes warmer, some people might just take those savings. Other people may open the windows to cool it down a little bit. And, and we're seeing that again and again. And in, in some of the kind of large scale retrofits, this is a common problem. The, the rebound effect, um, I mean, this has been, it's been uh, known about since the, the Industrial Revolution, and it's the equivalent of, of buying a tub of, of low-fat ice cream, but because it's low-fat, you can eat twice as much, and that kind of <laughs> happens, um, and we're seeing a lot in the building. So if there isn't, if people and their behaviour aren't front and centre, um, there's no point in spending, you know, giving um, kind of interest-free loans or full-on investing in uh, upgrading properties and just ignoring the inhabitants if they're not given the skills to okay so that is a little bit warmer this is how you work your thermostat and then kind of tying it in in together um th that's a kind of a, a missed opportunity and just one other point to kind of veer in away um one thing that in my opinion was kind of absent in the climate change plan is um aviation obviously it has huge uh, impact on the environment and a lot more than kind of some of the the, the smaller things that might be seen as slightly kind of tinkering around the edges. Um, I just thought it was a, a notable omission, but I'm sure there are other reasons for that. Rachel Howe. Um, in terms of um, 
sectors to focus on or behaviours to focus on. Um, I think one that needs quite a lot of focus is on food, because this is one of the behaviours that's perhaps uh, least understood, the links between um, diet and uh, climate change. And here, again, there are some fantastic co-benefits. We don't have to rely on a narrative that's all about climate change, which you know, not everybody is really connected into, um, because the, the, the need to change behaviour, from particularly from um, re reducing meat and dairy intake, is exactly the same advice as for healthy lifestyle. Um, so this, you know, this needs to be one of the things to focus on, and there are ways to tackle this which don't have to be about climate change legislation. For example, um, really stringent animal welfare legislation which would be very popular with a lot of people, will drive up the cost of meat and will change the balance when people are making choices about what their main protein source should be. Um, you can work with uh, GPs and hospitals to make sure there's plenty of advice about eating healthily, and that needs to include how to uh, find and cook alternatives. I'm always astonished when um, my students tell me that it is more expensive not to eat meat. I, you know, I think they must be substituting meat with expensive processed uh, meat alternatives like corn or recipes which involve very expensive things like cashew nuts and pine nuts and not realising just uh, how plentiful and cheap pulses and so on are. Um, Transport we've talked a lot about, so I won't go over that, but transport is an area in which we haven't seen the progress that needs to be seen, that we really need to focus on getting emissions down from transport because they've been static for a long time. In terms of land use, I think this bill needs to establish a nitrogen budget to drive changes in farming. Um, but all of this, I just want to say one more thing because the last comments I made may have sounded rather harsh and one thing I want to make really clear is all of these changes are going to have very significant impacts. The sort of level of change we need is going to have very significant impacts, as you mentioned, in various different, whether it's urban, rural, di differential impacts or whether it's particular sectors in terms of jobs. And so there needs to be attention paid in this bill to um, ensuring a just transition. There needs to be a kind of some kind of commission that has oversight to ensure that these transitions are just transitions. So it's to, to, to work out how to mitigate the problems, for example, for people who live in rural areas. I certainly don't want to just sort of say, well, it's tough luck. There needs to be attention paid to that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry, can I just, I'm sorry, I'm quite exercised by all that you've just said and where you're essentially saying that, you know, the rural areas should be disadvantaged um, for, well, you, you did say that earlier, I appreciate you've now corrected it. But, um, well, but that's the practicality of what you're saying, that the rural areas would be disadvantaged for the benefit of the, the majority. And I don't actually think that that's progress um, to, to, be, to benefit the many by disadvantaging the few. So if that is what you are saying, then there does have to be something done. And I also think it's a fairly grim picture, your painting of a meat-free livestock, free landscape, where we're all encouraged or if not forced to eat pulses, that's not a future that I welcome. I think you're putting words into my mouth here. I wasn't saying that everybody needs to eat a meat-free diet. I was saying we need to reduce the amount of meat and dairy that people take in. They don't have to eat pulses at every meal. But I'm suggesting that people will be healthier. They'll be eating a healthier diet, which will be cutting down the uh, heart disease and so on. Uh, I'm certainly not imagining that this has to be everybody turning vegan, and that's actually one of the very unhelpful messages that's com coming out. This is not about sort of extremes. This is about very large numbers of people making reductions rather than very small numbers of people going to the extremes. Uh, and in terms of the rural areas, I'm very sorry that I perhaps did not express myself clearly enough. I certainly don't feel that rural areas should be disadvantaged. But no policy at all can be brought in without some disadvantage to some people. And we've got to try and mitigate that disadvantage. But we can't simply say we cannot do anything if there is some disadvantage to some people, we've got to look at how we can offset that. And there are ways that you might be able to offset that. But if we say, well, we just can't bring in the sort of policies we need to do to change behaviour at the level we need to change it, then what we're saying is we are accepting three to four degrees warming by the end of this century, and that's going to be a tremendous disadvantage for everybody. 
Before, before I go back to Claudia Beamish, there is, there is another um, issue in, in what we're talking about as well, and that's people on low incomes who really are not thinking, well, I want to change the environment, therefore I'm going to eat this, that, and the next thing. They're just thinking about how they can get through the week. So we have to make, make things work for everybody. And I'm just wondering, particularly, you know, um, I'm sure you've all got points, the just transition has to not disadvantage those on low incomes as well. So things like getting a better boiler, it's just not a, a, a thing that would even cross someone's mind if they can't even pay their electricity bill, um, they can't even put food on the table. How, how do we deal, how we deal, deal with that? I mean, the majority of people are not in a position to talk about getting a, a, a heat pump installed. Can anyone, anyone come in with that? Um, Shane Donald. Um, you spoke earlier uh, about the two-tiered kind of approach and that's where the people who can afford um, air source heat pumps need to be encouraged to do so, so that funding can be directed to people who cannot, uh, as is, is kind of currently practiced, but the kind of the, the self-funded um, uh, body, they, they maybe haven't been prioritized over the years. They're, they're more difficult to engage with. People don't necessarily, lots of people don't know how what what is the hook and I, and I don't think it has been fully cracked yet but by by placing expectations on people um and and the the term self funded it's gone through different iterations i know we did some some um internal research and we, initially we'd been referring to people as able to pay anyone who wasn't at risk of fuel poverty was able to pay when we actually kind of completed the research we found that actually people don't see themselves as being able to pay. They don't see themselves as sitting on a huge pile of money just because they're on a higher income. They don't see themselves as squandering money and opening windows when the heat is on. Um, but their threshold is a little bit higher. Um, I think uh, the, the example of a coffee machine, they, they say, well, I like good coffee, so I've got a coffee machine. I've got a 50-inch TV, um, but I don't waste energy. I just like my quality of life. And that's, and that's kind of the, the threshold just gets raised and people's lifestyle use a little bit more energy. These are the people that really need to be engaged going forward um, to to get our source heat pumps, to invest in energy efficiency that the likes of uh, home energy um, efficient programmes can't fund where they're funding people more in fuel poverty. So I think that would be the approach. It's, yep. Jamie Stewart wants to come in. I think it's a, a really important point you make. Um, we certainly see through the, the Citizens Advice Bureau network that people are coming in, they're in stressed, chaotic environments, um, they might be in, in debt, they might be in energy debt, so the thought of them uh, having um, you know, the financial capability or the time or the engagement levels to, to invest in a new boiler is, is a big risk for the Scottish Government, I think. Um, and where targets rely on people in those situations making those kind of decisions, I, I think there's a big risk that we'll then miss targets. I think in terms of solutions, um, it's very important that we provide uh, sort of holistic advice and support to people. So if you're uh, giving advice to someone, um, it should be you know holistic. You can look at uh, giving people benefits checks, so looking at sort of uh, maximising their incomes. Alongside that, and maybe a little bit further down the line, you might look at what grants and incentives might be available to, to upgrade your property. But again, uh, it's about tackling uh, the sort of, there's a priority of issues almost, and I think you need to tackle the, the most pressing issues. And then once that relationship's built up, um, and often this advice needs to come uh, sort of in a face-to-face -face, uh, scenario, you can then look at trying to provide people with support um, like, like the grants that are available through the Scottish Government to install boilers uh, for, certain, for certain people. Yeah, Mark Ruskell. Uh, just coming back to the, the, the kind of rural um, issues again, I think there's, there's some interesting examples from Nordic countries around how, you know, kind of services and the economy get kind of, you know, focused on a rural area. And I'm just wondering if how... How much of a change you believe that you know broadband and you know the new economy, if, if you like, the new way of of, uh, of organising the economy might have a, an impact on rural areas going forward? Because there's a tendency at the moment to think you know everybody going to the city to to work or to access services or whatever, and I'm just wondering to what extent that kind of cultural shift around relocalisation and.
Mary Sweetland. Um, I think there are examples. Scotland could be doing more on green tourism, but to have that, if you want to stop all the visitors to the national parks using cars, then you need to have the infrastructure there. You need to have broadband there that's reliable. And then that would develop rural jobs as well. But it, it's quite a shift to actually even encourage the visitors to Scotland to do without their, their cars and the congestion that that causes when you're going to Valmaha on a, at the weekend when there isn't any parking and things. So, you know, it, it's a whole economic shift that you've got to think about as well as you push it, it through. In um, some areas, like the, there's, going back to the community effect of mitigation um, for energy, there are community hydro schemes that are in place that are potential of bringing in can, an, an enormous amount of funding to local communities. Um, but the costs of moving them forward, putting in a turbine, and apparently most of the old rural um, the old houses that are the big county type houses all had a local hydro, their own hydro scheme 100 years ago, which has gone into dis repair. Now, that could be brought back in, recommissioned, as has happened in near Tainault, to produce energy on a um, community basis. Um, and instead of having to pay millions, of, 10 million pounds, I think it was, to put in the new hydro scheme, maybe there could be some way that Scotland could be pushing forward in rural areas to find those old schemes, re-establish them, and generate electricity locally that could then be used to charge electric cars, would put the infrastructure in a place around, around the community and attract some green tourism there. Claudia Beamish has one last question before right, we move thank on. Thank you. Um, this is kind of a vision question, which um, if anyone knows the answer to, we'll sigh with relief, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, what would anyone on the panel say would need to change in terms of um, behaviour, particularly to go beyond the 90% um, percent target which the Scottish Government has in the bill at the moment to meet a net zero target by 2050 at the latest. Um, as I say, it's, it's a, a probing question. If anyone has any thoughts in terms of behaviour change, we'd value them. Anyone want to take go first on that? Um, just very quickly. Um, I would say it's very difficult to um, put, see where behaviour change fits relative to 90%, relative to 100%, given that behavioural targets mightn't have been put uh, forward in the first place, kind of, I think that was my, my opening comment. So if we don't know what the targets are, they, there's the, the climate change plan refers to widespread uptake of EVs, how widespread is widespread, or um, kind of societal shifts in, in how we work and live. How many? What is that? So for, for me, it's difficult to add 10% onto that, if, if that makes sense. Okay, Jamie Stewart. What? Yeah, I think <clears throat> looking at the sector, the domestic sector again, which I apologise, it's the one I, I know most about. Um, I think if we're looking at making uh, certainly all properties EPCC by 2040, and I think uh, that would certainly have to be met if you're going towards even a 90% target. I think you know you're then relying on the owner occupier sector, and uh, that's again we're looking at potentially quite expensive uh, measures. So you need um, again for it to be aspirational for people, and I think you need the right uh, grants and incentives um, to encourage people uh, to get to that that stage where they are upgrading their properties to be to be energy efficient. Okay, Rachel Hill. Um, as you kind of recognise, there isn't a nice, neat answer to your question, so I can't give one. But I, I'm feeling uncomfortable that we're perhaps focusing too much on the individual and choice. To me, when I hear questions about behaviour, that's what I'm hearing questions about, is the individual and choice. And I, I would like to come back again. That what we're looking at to meet the sort of targets we need to be aiming at, which needs to be net zero by 2050, not 90%, we are looking at huge structural rollouts. We're looking at an urgent phase closure of the oil and gas industry with just transition to a huge programme of renewables, which Scotland has 
has the, the best wind and uh, tidal, sorry, wave and tidal resources in the whole of Europe, so can be a tremendous leader on. Um, so we're looking at going quite a long way beyond. Now, that doesn't mean that we're just going to ignore individuals because we need engagement with new technologies, we need engagement with this, this programme of change, but we certainly can't put the responsibility on individuals um, to get as far as we need to go. It's, it's got to be, be much more than just persuasion and voluntarism. The, the sort of behaviours we need, we, we basically need to make um, it's either the cheapest or the easiest or the most normal thing to do to um, travel in ways that don't use fossil fuels, to heat one's home in ways that don't use fossil fuels, to eat a lower carbon diet and so on. Um, and that also comes back to the question about uh, people on lower incomes. There's a, a very strong correlation between income and greenhouse gas emissions. So we don't actually want to be targeting the, the lower income people with messages about buying air source heat pumps. It just sort of, you know, people can end up feeling sort of guilty and stressed about what they can't do. That's why we need the kind of structural change where you're, you're aiming at the, uh, the landlords, the social landlords, who can make a difference. And you get the benefits for the lower income people from this change. You know, in cities, it's the lower income people who live in the, the inner cities who are suffering most from air pollution. So the changes we need are actually going to be of benefit to them. And that's part of the, the message that we need to get out. OK. Um, maybe Sweetland, and then we're going to move on to Richard Lyle's questions. Yeah, the answer is reduce consumption. And that doesn't fit very well into macroeconomic models. Um, we have to go get back to a make, do and mend. Stop having throw away uh, culture. Um, that would bring the skill sets up as well, at being able to repair things again. Um, and that's the drastic changes that are needing to be done and bring that through back to thrift. But economics people might struggle with that one. <laughs> a, a, good, a good question to maybe follow on when we've got businesses in front of us. Yeah. Right, we're going to move on to Richard Lyle's questions. Yeah, I think Dr Hill and Mary Sweetland, basically, are, are, are going to agree with what I'm going to say. We all need to change. We need to change. Because if we don't change, we're letting our grandchildren, our children, the future of this planet down. So are we not just kidding ourselves on? Are we not just touching the edges and doing the easy fixes? Do we really need to get real? And basically my question is, what barriers currently exist to achieving the required behavioural changes and how can these be overcome and who should be responsible for that? I'm sure that gives you plenty to say. Shane Donnellan. So I suppose, the, are we getting ourselves um, are we, and, and that's a question to the Scottish Government and to the wider public, we can't celebrate uh, the ambitions which have been kind of recognised globally and as, as being particularly ambitious since the, the Climate Act 2009 and since. I think there, there have been some really good um, targets, but we can't congratulate ourselves if we're not then trying to achieve them and actually really trying to drive that change. So, like some of the barriers that feed into that are, are this, this acceptance that actually, no, we will. It mightn't be the most comfortable for everyone. There's going to be a need for some tough political decisions. There's going to be a need for um, members of the community to step up and do more than they're doing. Um, business as usual solutions will lead, or approaches will lead to business as usual solutions. And, and the targets really are they're, they're, they are ambitious. We do need to step up. Um, in terms of other barriers, um, I think Jamie had mentioned earlier about people not recognising the impact of their own individual behaviours. Uh, I think that needs to be emphasised, but there also needs to be good um, leadership. People say, well, you know, I can, I can turn down my thermostat by a degree, but there is an industrial plant on the outskirts of town belching out CO2. There does need to be some regulation so that that this is a kind of a systemic approach and it isn't just just um, kind of carrot and stick of, of you know, Mrs Jones on the street having to change. This needs to be across society, businesses, industry, um, local authorities having a lot, of, a lot of role in that, which kind of leads me in. I think there is a strong 
role for lo local authorities, but also community groups. Not and it's not necessarily that people always want what's best for their community. They want, uh, in my experience, what's best for them within their community. Um, so the community organisations are are great at at engaging with individuals who are concerned about their family and how things will affect them and what changes they will have to make um, as a kind of an in-between the local authorities, if that makes sense. Mary Sweetland. One of the things that we found within the Eco Congregation uh, Scotland network, we started off, and you'll know most of our um, members of churches are in the, the grey-haired arena nowadays and their view at the beginning was well what's the point we're not going to be here and actually we've seen a change they now with the communications and things they now accept we need to do this for our grandchildren and children so that is a, a big shift that we've managed to bring about through the um, 450 odd churches that are involved across scotland but the churches also are the main source of volunteers within Scotland and by bringing about the individual action and things that they're doing they're talking to the community groups that are using the church buildings and seeing what they're doing so they can actually make sure polystyrene isn't used anywhere and, and educate the people that are coming to the churches so we're beginning to roll that out through different networks and it's like, like the community asset model that's there that, that we can bring forward and we want to make sure that there are ministers and priests in Scotland that actually say climate change isn't happening what's it to do with us and part of the role of our environmental chaplain is to make sure that there is nobody from any of uh, the Christian faith and even working with um, other faiths in Scotland that actually question that they haven't got a responsibility to be bringing about the behaviour change that looks after the world. Rachel Hill. Um, I do agree with you in part, but I would like to begin by saying I think that the Scottish Government is genuinely really trying to um, lead here, and I think that's excellent. I think um, there's a, a real attempt to make changes. So I don't think we're just kidding ourselves in that sense. I think um, this is very, very genuine. I do unfortunately think that we will be kidding ourselves um, if we stick with the targets that are currently in the bill. We are kidding ourselves if 90% um, by 2050 and 66% by 2030, which doesn't represent very significant change from what we've already got, is enough for a, where we need to get to, and B, in terms of justice. Um, and that is important in terms of psychologically engaging people with this, because we are going to be looking at very significant changes. Now, why would you make that if it's going to get you perhaps nearly to where you want to be, but not quite there? It's not going to be helpful to um, encourage people if they're hearing from um, organisations like Stop Ca Climate Chaos and from uh, academics like Kevin Anderson that actually the targets put in place are not going to be good enough. That's not uh, an engaging narrative. Um, so I think that's one very important thing. In terms of whose responsibility it is, I actually have a lot of sympathy with policymakers. I think you're between a rock and a hard place. I think that a few years ago, I was saying this outside, um, to Jamie. I think a few years ago there was quite a strong narrative from the public of um, we really want you to do something about climate change but we don't want you to do anything that really impacts us. I think that narrative is actually changing now uh, and I think people are looking for very strong leadership and I think Scotland is in a fantastic place to offer leadership and to offer a very positive aspirational narrative about leadership within the UK and leadership within the international community on climate change. So I think there's a huge responsibility on the government, but I think we share it too. Uh, so myself as a teacher, uh, my colleagues here as public engagers, we all share that responsibility. And it is ours now in this moment, because it is our generation that has to do this. We have to make these changes now. It's the policymakers, the teachers, and so on of today that have got to change this. So it's our moment. Thank you. Jimmy Stewart. I think, um, just to stress what Rachel said as well, I think the Scottish, Scottish Government are quite leading in this area and they 
They do have a low carbon behaviours team uh, there. They have the ISM tool, which is a good tool to look at um, how behaviour should uh, be incorporated into, into public policy. I think it's important, though, to have a bit more clarity about what is really expected of people. I don't think that at the moment necessarily needs to be immediately communicated to, to individual households. But in terms of meeting targets, uh, there's within the climate change plan, there are, are, are kind of set targets for uh, the one-off behaviour changes, like installing energy efficiency measures. But people don't really know and organisations don't know beyond that what's expected of, of individuals and whether individual change is, is required or not. And I think in terms of the Scottish Government, they should maybe be trying to make that, that clearer so that the, the delivery organisations uh, on the ground, um, the grassroots organisations, almost know what they're, they're striving for in terms of behaviours as well. Um, I, I've got a question for you. I mean, we, we, we heard from, as I mentioned before, from, from, from two individuals from Sweden, and they said that up until now it's been incremental, the change. But transformational change is now required. What do you see that transformation being? And who's, who, I mean, who, is, is, is it really going to be incumbent in government in order to put things in place for that transformational change? Um, you know, if, 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 you, if you were in a position where you had to say, right, I am going to, I'm going to lead this transformation and I'm going to do X, which is going to make the biggest difference. I mean, just be interested, I mean, that's a very difficult question to ask, but I mean, what do you think should be tackled first in order to drive this transformational change that's not going to, you know, disadvantage ordinary Scots so much in, in making this, you know, being part of this transformation? I've asked a really difficult question. I'm, I'm aware of that, but you know, that, that's that's the big question. You know, how how what is the transformation, and how do we bring people with us, Mary Sweetland? Part of the what we do through the eco congregation uh, networks is it's the early adopters. Somebody asked me yesterday, why had I gone to an electric car? Why didn't I get hybrid? And my answer to that was, there was a interest free loan and from Scottish Government and I wanted to show that you could, you know, travel from Gartaharm to Edinburgh using an electric car and it worked and it was reliable. So I adopted. But now three or four people other people have followed that lead. And I think that's one of the things that local networks can do. Uh, we had West a plastic free Western Barton, someone there talking to us in our local network meeting yesterday. And again, there were people there that were sharing ideas and having communities that can do that um, to bring about that transformational change, I think, is how we see things going. But having the leadership that says we need to go there and clear messages coming not just from the environment, but across the whole of Scottish uh, government rather than... Because, you know, you sometimes think that it's not joined up. And I think the environmental issue of tackling that needs to give a straightforward approach. Every department needs to think about what the impacts of their policies are that could have an impact on the environment. Jamie Stewart. I think it's almost a, a kind of, almost a cause of anxiety that people feel like this big transformational change uh, has to happen, um, but they're not quite sure what they need to do. I think the recognition that a lot of that transformational change will come from different sectors as well. So maybe if we look at sectors where the emissions haven't reduced, like the agricultural sector, like the transport sector, um, I, I feel that you know all the emphasis shouldn't be put on that individual and, and a guilt-driven uh, sort of agenda to try and make them change. I think there needs to be um, kind of agreement that that transform transformational change will come from all sectors. And as an individual, you can you can play your bit. Uh, play your part and potentially electric vehicles will be a, a route for individuals to uh, reduce their transport emissions and beyond that I think the other changes in terms of how we heat, heat your home, um, insulating your properties, things like that, potentially eating less meat, it's not, it shouldn't be a big scary change, it should be simple changes that you, you want to make like reducing, reducing meat consumption. Um, I think there's, we should try and steer away from this kind of build up of fear of we need to 
make really big individual changes. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Um, we're trying to tease out the barriers to behaviour. And I just wanted to briefly explore perception versus reality. And the context for doing that is something that uh, Shane said earlier. He said it's cheaper to fly to London than get the train. I've just done a check on the 10th of December, leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning. The train is £34. The cheapest flight is £58. Not only that, you're at an airport, you're not in the city. The additional surface travel for getting to the city centre is a further 2160. Therefore, the train is 34 and flying is a total of £71.60. Now, that is booking a month ahead. Is it not the case that there's a perception problem that when you fly, you plan ahead, but when you get the train, you buy a walk-up fare? And when you do that, then the flying looks cheap. How do we tackle that? And, you know, in a sense, I'm very gently accusing Shane of perpetuating a myth. And I would say, personally, I've never found, except perhaps one example, when I've looked at the cost of travelling between Edinburgh and London, that it's cheaper to fly. And it's certainly not quicker, and it's certainly much more hassle. So how do we tackle perception and reality, of which that's one example? Well, Shane <laughs> might. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you want to go first. Mentioned in Stuart's question. If you want to come back, then I'll take Rachel Hill. Shane wants time to think. Um, <laughs> I think I think you're right in some ways, and um, not always right. There is definitely uh, an issue about perception and reality. Research, for example, shows that people um, underestimate how long it takes to get somewhere by car, and overestimate how long it will take to do the same journey, walking or cycling. Um, we also have very different ideas about delays. If a train is 10 minutes delayed, everyone complains about how poor the train service is. You would never expect, if you were making the same journey in a car, to say to the people you're visiting, I'm going to arrive at 3 minutes past 12, and consider yourself late if you arrive at 13 minutes past 12. You will say, I'll probably be with you around lunchtime or you know, somewhere between 12 and 1, something like that. So there's a real I interesting issue about how people approach decisions. Um, one of the things is you can just make people aware of that. Um, so sometimes people can change the way they think simply be, by being aware. So, for example, the bystander effect, which is the effect where um, if there are several people who witness something that needs action taken, all of them wait for the other people to do something, can be reduced or eliminated by telling people that that's what happens so that they know that actually that's going to happen and they need to be the one who... who who makes the effect. So if you start telling people about this sort of th thing that happens and, and getting them to think about how long do you plan in advance for a flight and how long do you plan for a train, that might help change people's behaviour. I don't think it is always the case, so I think we do also need to, to tackle the actual real barriers. So it is actually often cheaper to fly because you've got to think about why people are going to London. Are they taking the flight just to London or are they going on? So one of the real problems is that you can buy a through ticket if you're flying down to London in order to get to Singapore, but you want to try and do some long distance journey by train, you can go to a very wonderful website, The Man in Seat 61, but it will tell you all, a whole load of different train companies and you will not be able to buy a through ticket and there'll be all sorts of different um, deadlines by which you need to book the cheap ticket in advance. So you're booking from Edinburgh to London and getting your £34 or whatever it was by one date, but you can't be absolutely certain that you're going to get the follow-on ticket from London to Paris or wherever else because the, the booking window for that isn't yet open. So it's, it, we need to think also about all the different kinds of ways that people are, are doing these things and making sure that everything is much more joined up. But um, yeah. I'll do Seat 61, um, I use Krakow to Bucharest, eh, to Budapest, by had to fly, was 11 times more expensive than Budapest eh, to Bratislava, which was actually further. Anyway. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, we, we're really going to have to move on rather than talking about how to get to Bucharest. And I, I po apologies, but we, are, we have got some other questions that we really need to answer. I'm going to move on to Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener, uh, and good morning. Um, 
in the evidence that's already been mentioned uh, that we took from Sweden last week, from, from Stefan uh, Nuström and uh, Anders uh, Weikman, um, they spoke of how easy it would be to communicate a net zero uh, target uh, to the general public as opposed to um, lesser targets or, or, or speaking in, in percentages, which can make it difficult for the, the general public to, to comprehend fully. So um, we've already explored uh, this to a degree th this morning. Um, but so, so, you know, just quickly, um, would it be possible for uh, the, the panel to expand on, on how policymakers can secure popular support and, more importantly, buy-in uh, for Scotland's climate change targets? Shane? OK, I, uh, the, the kind of communication involved, someone um, mentioned this before, and it's, it, it's a bit of a shock phrase, but war effort. Um, kind of, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of um, people kind of who are st still with us refer back to the war and how it was a case of everyone getting on board and doing your bit and playing your part, and ev every... <coughs> Every single person was part of the war effort. And I'd like to kind of stop the analogy at war. It's not, you know, I don't think um, bringing doom and gloom is, is, will be a helpful motivator for people. But really having this, y you have a role. It's, uh, it's up to you. It, it's not a case of, of just doing one or two kind of really visible, clear behaviours. It's a lens. It's a way of living your life. It's a new approach. Um, kind of building on momentum. I, Again, coming back to the, the meat eating, um, a survey this week um, found that 600,000 Britons are identifying as vegan, which is a fourfold increase in four years. And this is because there's, it's now okay to be so. Um, we don't all need to go vegan. That's not what I'm saying. But um, it, that, that has been normalised. There, you know, there's now better options in supermarkets, uh, in restaurants. It's no longer just the pursuit of the, the elite who don't have to worry about you know, where their next meal is coming from. It's now an option, or if not vegan, vegetarianism, or because everything needs a label, flexitarianism, which is just reducing the amount of meat you eat. And two thirds of Britons in this uh, national survey, uh, two thirds of people have uh, reported reducing the amount of meat they consume within the last couple of years, um, largely due to environmental reasons, largely due to the fact that other people are doing it. So this kind of idea of a war effort of that we that we do need without calling it a war effort that we do need to bring everyone on board is going to be key. Okay. Mary Sweetland. I think that the media coverage that the IPC re recent report has had actually says that people are very keen on doing the bit and a net zero target would be well accepted across Scotland because it would then make people realize that they they do need to take some action. Jamie Stewart. Just, just a brief point. I think almost gaining public support for a, a net zero 2050 target is, is the easy part. I think the more difficult bit is, is getting public support for the actual programmes that come into place next year. So if you look at the owner occupier sector again, is there a regulation that says you're going to have to do something to your house? Um, you need the public support for the short-term programmes that facilitate those long-term targets. And I think that's, that's the important part. And it's important to do uh, consumer research and research to understand what makes people uh, want to participate in, in those short-term targets rather than just thinking by 2050, yeah, we should be net zero. It's important to think about what actually takes place in, in the next few years. So how very briefly, an attractive and engaging narrative is the justice narrative. So justice within Scotland and justice across the world. Um, I think framing this as something that is going to be about us playing a just part is very attractive to people. Um, and I think there's all sorts of um, organisations that will help to push that narrative. For example, uh, Scotland has ties with Malawi. So there are lots of different organisations that will be interested in that as part of their work. Do you think that the economics of it should also be an argument. The opportunity, economic opportunity for people is something that I, I, f I feel sometimes doesn't get talked about. The, the, the kind of structural changes I'm suggesting will lead to a huge programme of job, jobs building as long as we do it properly and with proper thought and as I mentioned the whole just transition thing. You don't just sort of you know, allow people's jobs to drop, drop away but you, you bring in. There is a tendency sometimes it sort of talks about giving stuff up. You know, 
changing things in a negative way. We need to reverse it to changing things in a positive way. This is about gaining um, health, healthier um, lifestyles, safer streets, um, cleaner ways of living, um, being looked up to as a leader. You know, there's a whole lot of very positive narratives. And, you know, I keep using the word co-benefits. It's very, very important. This doesn't all have to be about climate change legislation either. This can be about all sorts of other concerns that people feel very strongly about air pollution and healthy lifestyles. Yeah. Angus, are you... Uh, Thanks. Move on to questions from Rhoda Grant. Yes. Um, Citizens Advice Scotland has identified four areas which are likely to influence how certain policies will impact on consumers differently, and those are ones we've spoken about already, um, those living in urban and rural areas, um, socio-economic status of consumers, um, but also local authority area and um, consumers' housing tenure. Um, how, I mean, given what we have heard this morning, and I suppose a degree of disappointment in that, especially for those in rural areas and those um, maybe of a lower socio-economic um, status, um, it looks like this could build in huge disadvantage in already disadvantaged communities. So I'm just wondering, how can these considerations be built in um, to the future of climate change policy and a just transition that doesn't leave people behind or doesn't damage other people's interests that would take people ahead? So I think that's certainly something that's been concerning me this morning. Jamie. I think, thanks for raising the points. I think, um, again, it's trying to look at the potential co-benefits and, and opportunities rather than uh, the negative impacts. I think there are risks that there are negative impacts, but if we look at uh, the f people in fuel poverty, so there's 26.5% of people in fuel poverty at the moment in Scotland, and a lot of them are living in energy inefficient homes. Um, so I think, t you know, looking at programmes where there's the appropriate financial support from the, gr from the government to help people uh, insulate their homes, that will hopefully not have a negative impact on that household if there's the grants to, to help them. And there will be positive health impacts. So I think trying to look at uh, programmes like that where you help to reduce emissions, but you also have the co benefit of improving uh, health and wellbeing. Um, I think it's really important to look at programmes that, that focus on those co, co benefits. Mary Sweetland. I think. I wonder if the, the challenge is actually in setting the targets to make sure there is something that is focused on the rural specifically. Because if you think about the rollout of super fast broadband, great target, but any company will go ahead and take the, the low hanging fruit and push that. And it's the final 5%, which are the rural communities that don't actually have the broadband there yet. And it's actually making sure there's a target there that is specific to rural communities so that they don't get left at the end, but are actually up front. And that might be something for you to, to try and, and focus on and think about to make sure that they aren't left disadvantaged in, in the climate change. But I mean, the rural, if people are able to work from home, they don't need to travel as much. They can video conference into meetings rather than have to travel two hours to come to Edinburgh for, for less today. Um, you know, that is the societal change that needs to happen. We won't have meetings for meetings' sake. We'll have other ways of communicating. And people can stay in their rural areas and do that. Yeah. Broadband. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk to me about that at the moment. Yeah. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Convener. And I should have declared an interest as a farmer and a one-time rural dweller myself in my previous exchange with Dr Howe. Uh, much has been said about what needs to be done, um, particularly in rural areas, um, which are already disadvantaged, as, as Rhoda Grant has already said, lack of services, lack of broadband, fuel poverty. Uh, and if a two-tier society is really being envisaged, and I think de facto that is what is being said, what are the practical things that can be done I mean, what, what is, uh, for example, academia? I throw it back at you, the challenge doing about knowledge transfer. You, you appear to have given up the voluntary approach. So what 
perhaps we, we should look at, uh, you know, uh, are you entirely satisfied that you've done all you can in terms of advising businesses, rural businesses, um, how they should best proceed in terms of what um, should they should or should be doing in future? I'm not certain that that work is being done by the government at the moment. I'm not sure it's being done by academia. And I'll just be interested to hear what you have to say on that. Yeah. Dr. Hill. No academic is ever satisfied. They've done enough in terms of research or um, transferring knowledge. You know, the, the job is never, ever finished. Um, and um, <laughs> the pressures on my work at the moment mean that my main uh, avenue of knowledge transfer is to students. Um, it's becoming harder and harder to do the job of going beyond the university because of the pressure of the numbers of students. Um, so I suppose my, I see my main sphere of influence, partly because actually I'm in the job because I absolutely love teaching and facilitating learning. My main sphere of influence is with those um, students. I personally have certainly not done enough uh, about talking to rural businesses because that's not my expertise. And, you know, I'm, I'm feeling quite sorry now that I've that I've been misunderstood in terms of um, perhaps my expertise and what I was trying to say. I'm not envisaging a two-tier society at all. Um, I was envisaging that there might be sort of different speeds at which things are rolled out and that there should not be um, penalties on people who live in rural areas if they are not able to roll things out in the same speed. So, for example, you know, I'm, I'm anti the idea of having a huge carbon tax, for example, precisely because it would uh, disproportionately impact on poorer people and people living in more rural, rural areas. Um, so, yeah, there, there definitely does need to be a whole load more research to be done, um, and there needs to be more people doing it um, yeah, that, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's what any academic is going to say, always. So, I mean, I don't mean it badly, I really don't, but uh, would it be fair to say that we're long in analysis here today about what the problems are, but we're short on solutions? Um, and, uh, and I just think, well, maybe others disagree with me, Claudia. Right, well, that, well that's fine, but this is what the debate is about. Um, well, I would like to hear more about the solutions, um, and I'm just not certain that we're being told the absolutely practical solutions that need to be done, because I, I agree with what the panel has said in as much as there is a willingness to change, and I think that is manifest across every aspect of, of, of life in Scotland, but there's a, an uncertainty about what needs to be done to, to, to take, put one's shoulder to the wheel. I, I think um, I don't think we're short on solutions. I think we're short on a very detailed roadmap of exactly how to get there and how to do that justly. Um, but this isn't entirely the fault of researchers. When you do research, you cannot be certain what the outcome is going to be. So, for example, um, you know, Cancer Research UK has not yet managed to eliminate cancer. That doesn't mean that they're not doing really, really important work. And every time that something is published where we find that such and such a treatment doesn't work, that's just as valuable as where we find what does work. Now, I started early by saying, I'm sorry to say that in 10 years of research, I've learned a lot about what doesn't work or what doesn't work very well, what works only in incremental terms in terms of persuasion and uh, working with values and that kind of thing. Um, I. I that, that isn't, therefore, um, useless work, because it then points to the direction we do have to go, and that's why I'm changing my research program. All I can do is kind of tell you honestly what I have learned and how that, that has led my thinking to change. So, yes, it is much, much harder, and I share your frustration. Um, you know, I read academic papers, for example, with, with lots of... Um, uh, critique of governments for focusing too much on psychological and economic le levers and not focusing enough on the structures. And I'm saying, oh, but please tell us exactly how it would work. And, you know, some of these papers do. They talk about kind of whole system change. For example, the, the London congestion charge is a good example. But there aren't enough good examples. But it isn't necessarily because people are not trying. It's because this problem is really difficult. But I think knowing... Knowing, um, knowing what the analysis of what the real problem is is really important in order to find those solutions. And I do think that there are still some people 
within society, within the policy world, who are not accepting exactly what the problem is, exactly how serious it is. Um, you know, I was very struck by Kevin Anderson's talk. I was at his public talk last week. Many of you, I'm sure, were at his, his private uh, event with you. And, you know, his analysis was rather short on very detailed solutions, although he had some broad picture solutions. But nevertheless, it was still very valuable to hear exactly where he thinks we are at in terms of a fair carbon budget for Scotland and the big picture overall. Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Um, perhaps this final question, I could just bring us back to the, the actual bill um, and, and the targets and the scale of ambition. Um, so the UK Climate Change Committee has offered its view on targets. Um, it said that the current targets in the bill are at the limit of feasibility. Um, I wondered what, what your definitions are of, of what you consider to be feasible, um, and whether you do believe that we're at the limits of feasibility or, or indeed uh, other ways that we could be going further. What, what does feasibility mean in terms of behaviour change? Are we at that limit yet? Maybe Sweetland. I'll, I'll tack it. tackle it as someone that has a experience of setting targets um, in health service and always saying that it should be a goal. Um, so to set a goal that says um, that we want to be zero carbon in that time it's a long time out and the predictions that people are making will be adjusted over the next 30, 40 years. So I know that politicians get concerned about setting targets that they know won't be met. But actually, if you're about changing behaviours, to know that that's where you're driving to, OK, it may be missed at the end and we may only get to 95%, but at least you know what you're trying to get to. Um, might bring about the change better. Okay. I think in, in terms of, I agree that it seems like a long target and we have lots of time to change, but if you look at more kind of structural behaviours, things like buying a new boiler, you know, people have boilers in their homes for 30 or 40 years. So I think, you know, we're relying on, on programmes like Energy Efficient Scotland being um, successful. You know, I don't think we've got the time to risk another Green Deal, where we have a programme that looks really good on paper, but that's, you know, that's as far as it went. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of feasibility, those targets, um, you know, feel relatively feasible if these programmes work well and are designed well. I don't think we've, if we, um, if they don't work in this opportunity, we don't have that much time for it to, to you know, to try again. Consideration then in the UKCC's advice around the structural changes and the opportunities there and around technological innovation, or are we still very much reliant on people just making the right choice because they see an electric vehicle on the forecourt or, or something like that? Um, yeah, I think there is uh, maybe a tendency to do that, um, or, or you know, more efficient cars, electric vehicles as opposed to why we're driving, kind of thinking actually we need to stop tweaking and start changing. I do think, kind of going back to your earlier question, change is inevitable. Society will change, but it's how, what that change looks like, that can be shaped. Things are very different now in Scotland to how they were in the 80s, to how they were in the 60s. And there's any number of factors at play, but kind of strong leadership can shift what that change will involve. So if it is a case of people really, you know, thinking about what, how they're consuming, how they're, they're contributing to emissions, um, that can be a focus that can be capitalised on. Um, the UK Commission on Climate Change is thinking about feasibility in terms of what it can see a complete roadmap to. Um, and I think that's a mistake, personally, because the, the, the landscape will change as we move. I know in my own life that things that I thought were unfeasible for me to do have now become perfectly feasible because as I have made certain changes, that has absolutely changed the landscape in which I'm making those choices. In terms of what feasibility means, I think there's, two, there's actually two quite different ideas here. So there's what seems to be economically or psychologically or um, politically feasible, and then there are the immutable laws of physics, and that's a totally different level of feasibility. It is infeasible for us to imagine that we will uh, solve the problem of climate change unless we set 
uh, strong enough targets. And that is a sort of a, a, a wall of a different quality of hardness, of a different quality of impenetrability to the economic and political stuff. I think, you know, that's, that's the absolute and the economics and the pol politics will change. So I don't think we have to know the absolute total details of getting to the end if we have a strong enough narrative about why the end is net zero emissions by 2050 or whenever. Um, and I think that will make things more feasible as we go. Coming back to behaviour, and the Green Deal was mentioned. And I think, do you get a feeling in terms of people's behaviour and uh, that because of the way in which the Green Deal was sort of jumped upon by certain companies doing the cold calling, that that has immediately, I mean, I remember the, the, a good six months of just not answering my phone at the house because it was just, you're picking it up and it was about things that you just, and, and public confidence in these things, which were a well-meaning aspiration to have, you know, solar panels or, or whatever, became hijacked and then public confidence around that. So where would you see government coming in there to, to ensure that that public confidence and any new incentives that come out in order to drive behavioural change actually don't end up having the opposite effect? Shane Donnell. I think joined up thinking between local authorities, community organisations and strong leadership from the government. No project, no big infrastructure project um, in, is no one ever intends for it to fail. The Green Deal didn't work, but that wasn't anyone's intention. That was kind of systemic issues, things that got that hadn't maybe been considered in the planning phase or aspects of the change that just hadn't been prioritised. Um, earlier on, we spoke about incentives, and I mean this is an example of an incentive, but an incentive that didn't work uh, because it wasn't kind of considered in the wider context of all the other factors that would contribute to someone making a decision or not. And then when you do have things like the cold calling and that. It, it, it can just completely run away and, and it completely lose its purpose. People don't associate it with, um, you know, accessing finance. It, it, suddenly, it's associated with with the green deal and that, be, or with um, cold calls, and that becomes the meaning of it. So, I think a holistic approach that is that from day one has involvement of local authorities as well as the government um, to kind of to create a holistic plan. I know the holistic can be a kind of a buzzword that's thrown around, but that's what it will come back to. Something that people know that they can trust and they're not going to be ripped off because I think that's what actually happened um, in a lot of cases. I take it that Citizens Advice have got some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I think public trust in, in any kind of uh, what seems to be government-led programme is, is really important. And things like consumer protection, you know, it might be on the kind of drier side of things, but it's really important because if you have a scheme where, you know, someone within the system, whether it's a, a company, uh, you know, doesn't treat that household right or, or they have a poor level of service, if public confidence drops uh, in, in that programme, then there's huge risks that the word of mouth spreads that, no, it's not a good thing to do. And like a, the point I just made, we don't have that many opportunities to, to implement these changes. So I think having uh, some sort of body that's, that's well trusted um, with the appropriate consumer protections is, is really important. Okay. I, I think we've reached the end of our uh, question. I want to thank everyone in the panel for their time today. Um, I'm going to suspend this session briefly for the next panel to join us. Thank you very much, everyone.
I'm delighted to welcome our second panel for today's session. We're going to be looking at governance in the context of the Climate Change Emissions Redu Reductions Target Scotland Bill. Uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, joining us are Paul Gray, Chief Executive of NHS Scotland. Um, Mai Mohammed, Energy Manager of Aberdeen City Council. Tom Thackeray, Director of Infrastructure and Energy for CBI Scotland. And Chris Ruji, Chair of Sustainable Scotland Network. Good morning to you all. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a sort of general question about the role of public and private sector in driving the changes that we, it was incumbent upon us to, to make um, as, a, as a society. I mean, how, how can, what role can the public and private sector play in supporting wider low carbon behaviour change? And, and I guess I'll, I'll take the public sector first in that. I mean, if we start with uh, Paul Gray. Thank you, convener. Um, and just one thing in, in opening my response to your question. Uh, if, if there's anything that the committee wants to know in terms of facts that I don't have, I'll be very happy to provide that uh, a, a swift response after uh, today's uh, session. So, um, you know, just wanted to make that offer. I think, I think the public sector has to demonstrate a degree of leadership in this, and that's not to say that it rests exclusively with the public sector, but, for example, in terms of the way that uh, we procure new build or refurbishment, I think there has, there, we have to be exemplary um, uh, in our design and specification. Um, I think in terms of the way that we uh, prompt people through our public health initiatives to uh, take more exercise, not, that's not just about public health and improving the health of the population, but also reducing uh, the use of, of motorised transport. Um, the, the, the way in which we help our staff to understand uh, what, what this really means, it, because it can sound like quite an umbrella term, you know, climate change and reducing emissions and so forth, what, what it means in practice. And I do, if the committee wishes, have some examples of what we're doing in these areas. Would that, would that be helpful? Very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so, so in terms of governance, first of all, since you mentioned governance at the beginning, um, we've established a, a, an NHS Scotland National Energy Forum and a National Sustainability Steering Group. Now, these, are, the, these governance bodies um, are intended to review and manage the requirements of NHS boards, and the, the steering group in particular provides oversight and governance of sustainability issues, including the responsibilities with respect to public sector climate change reporting. And it also provides guidance to boards on production of reports so that we're reporting on a common standard. There is quite a lot we're doing in terms of procurement, our capital investment group, when it reviews uh, business cases and investment appraisals, takes advice from Architecture and Design Scotland on any uh, build or refurbishment uh, elements of that. And unless and until the architects are satisfied that the sustainability elements of that are sufficient, the, the business case will not be signed off. So the business case will not be signed off, even though you know, it may meet other value for money criteria or um, deliverability criteria. The sustainability uh, elements of it are critical to getting sign off. Um, we've just uh, launched in September of this year um, a sustainability action uh, branding and campaign. Now, again, I can provide some detail to the committee, but in, in principle, this highlights that all NHS staff, whether they be clinical, public health, management or estates, have a part to play in acting sustainably. Anyone working on a sustainability-related topic or wanting to promote change can use the Sustainability Action Toolkit that we've developed to promote their activities. And these examples will be shared more widely as they're gathered. Um, do you want more detail or will I pause there? Well, it would be good to hear from, from my Mohammed on, on what Aberdeen City Council are doing in that regard as well and, and what you feel that the, the local authorities have, have uh, got to offer in terms of leading the, the charge, I suppose. In terms of local authority, I feel um, Aberdeen is well placed um, because we have several um, strategies in place. Um, namely, we are the pilot for the low carbon 
um, heat energy efficiency strategy. So that's um, funded by Scottish Government. So we're looking at a pilot area where we can deliver low carbon heat, energy efficiency, energy efficiency in an area-wide basis, which includes the private sector and local authority. So that's one very current example. Other examples is um, we also try to introduce internally a building energy performance policy, and that looks at any new builds, uh, especially new schools, which are building for the future. Um, these are future buildings that will be there for the next 40 years. Um, and it's obviously for um, the, the teaching of the children today and for the future. So it's like future-proofing our buildings in terms of energy efficiency, what it looks like in terms of technology. So we're trying to introduce policies internally to look at this, so every project needs to then go through a checklist of what it means in terms of building performance. We also have um, a powering Aber Aberdeen strategy um, as part of our sustainable energy action plan. And that again is a city-wide initiative where we had a person that actually manages that program and, and tries to get in all the private sector in Aberdeen, as you, as you know, which is a large oil and gas sector, but obviously businesses, small, medium, and obviously the larger investments that are in Aberdeen. So asking them about what they can do in terms of climate change and how the council can work with them. And, and I think that's very key. It's, it's, it's one thing to show, obviously, we are leading it, but more importantly, to show a partnership approach. And I think Aberdeen is trying to do that, and, and I think we're doing well. So we're trying to engage a lot and, and carry a lot of meetings with the, the theme of sustainability, um, low carbon, energy efficiency. So it's, it's constantly there. And obviously, we also have a well-established um, ESCO, which is uh, Aberdeen Heat and Power, who deliver a district heating network. And that, again, we're growing that business um, within the city. So in terms of what we've got in place for climate change plans going forward, I think we are doing a lot already, but obviously there's a lot more work to do given the, the new climate change bill. Um, the public sector also own a large portfolio of buildings, and I think that's the same across most public sectors in Scotland. So we have a duty of care in terms of making sure these are again fit for the future in terms of energy performance, but also in terms of how we use these buildings in the future. Will they be used the same way as they are today? So it's thinking ahead of what buildings will be like in the future. And obviously we are one of the largest employer in the city. So we've got again, um, sort of um, uh, prosperous people is one of our local outcome improvement plans. So it's how we develop a climate change strategy that also benefits the people and the city of Aberdeen. Um, we are also part of the public body's duties reporting in terms of carbon emissions. So we have been doing that now for the last um, two years. So we, we, we are participating in that as well. So we can see how our emissions are obviously um, tracking the emissions profile over the last few years as well. And we're reporting that. The, the, the two of you are obviously um, leading large organizations that engage with the general public in a, a significant way. How do you think that you can encourage, incentivise, or are you encouraging and incentivise behavioural change around um, everything that's going to you know, help us meet our targets? I mean, you've, got a, you've got contacts with the majority of the, the populace, as well as your employees. Yeah, so, so I think the committee may be aware that we're um, uh, in the process of establishing a new public health body, bringing together um, the, uh, some of the responsibilities of NHS Health Scotland and also um, NHS National Services Scotland. And part of what lies behind that is uh, improving our impact on influencing uh, population level behaviour change. But I think there are also small things that we can do. Um, for example, uh, one of the health boards, um, and uh, if you uh, unless you press me, I'd rather not say which one, because I'm sure it's in more than one, uh, has a sign up in its bicycle part that says, um, more or less, you're bringing your bike at your own risk, and if anything to ha happens to it, it's not our fault. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, we, we could actually encourage people to use bikes by um, saying, you know, here is a place where you can leave your bicycle safely and, uh, you know, here's an opportunity to padlock it and so forth, um, rather than saying, uh, we'll, we'll 
you know, adopting what I would describe as quite a defensive attitude. Um, so I think I think these are th that's one thing we can do. Uh, another thing we've sought to do, and and I will say to the committee with with rather limited success so far, but it doesn't mean we'll, we'll, we'll not keep trying, is to provide access to public transport so that people don't have to use their cars to get to hospitals and other facilities. Now, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting here and now that, that that's not been a resounding success yet, but it, it is something I think we need to get better at. Um, I think also another thing that we can do is to try to make sure that we're maximising the use of technology so that people don't need to travel to come to uh, get access to health and care services. And we, we do have a number of examples of that. For example, people with uh, cardiac obstructive pul pulmonary disease, so heart and lung disease in Cumnock are now provided with facilities that mean that they can be treated f from a distance and it saves them coming to hospital, which is good for them, but it also, you know, it's saving on travel and emissions as well. I think uh, part of our, um, our own internal uh, sustainability action uh, plan, which we've just uh, launched, as I said, is providing people with, with supporting tools and programmes to allow uh, allow boards to baseline themselves not just on what they're doing in terms of buildings and the other sort of infrastructure things that I've mentioned, but also our overall um, progress towards the, 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 the Scottish National Performance Framework and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And why that matters is because I, I believe that with approximately 163,000 people employed in NHS Scotland, if we're not you know, we have a huge reach, not just with the people we treat, but the people we actually employ. And if we're not demonstrating exemplary behaviours, it's quite hard to be persuasive with the rest of the population when we say, you know, you should take more exercise, and, and, and we're not doing that. So I think it's about being an exemplar employer. It's about being an exemplar in, in the way that we design and build things. And there is also more, I think, we could say about what we're doing uh, to save public funds by adopting more sustainable uh, approaches to delivering services. Um, so, so, for example, in, in NHS Ayrshire and Arden, Girvan Community Hospital was, was, was designed in a way which minimised environmental impact. And without going into too much detail, although I can if the committee wishes, um, there'll be a 3 per cent reduction in Ayrshire and Arden's overall current CO2 emissions because of the th what we've done in one hospital. And that, that's really important that the public understand that we're taking this seriously in the services we provide in the way that we design and build things. And, and moving on to the, the private sector, because it's not just incumbent on the public sector to be leading the charge as well. And I particularly I want to hear from Tom Thackeray about what, what we can do in order to encourage behavioural change in the private sector, which follows on, works in partnership with the public sector and helps the, the country meet its uh, climate change targets. So I think you've hit the nail on the head there by saying that it's, this is about partnership. The challenge of climate change is bigger than either the public or private sector could meet on their own. So what are the um, mechanisms we put in place which enable businesses to invest uh, in, in climate change and green initiatives? Um, I'd say at the outset that CBI members that we speak to are instinctively positive about the climate change agenda and having ambitious targets. So in that sense, the uh, proposals in the bill to uh, set more ambitious targets are met with uh, enthusiasm and there's businesses see opportunity there. Um, and the, the leadership role that Scotland can play alongside Westminster in driving that change is, um, is really, really important. I think the thing that uh, members of the CBI would stress that they, those targets have to be accompanied by a policy regime which is uh, systems-wide, which makes them achievable and affordable. Um, and I think at the moment, their businesses see policy gaps which, in some instances, prevent them from playing that leadership role that... Um, I can, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, for example, um, we've seen massive um, cuts in carbon, um, carbon emissions from the power sector over the last five years and going back further than that. Um, but actually, if you look at uh, carbon emissions from the wider economy, from industry, from buildings, from transport, 
those emissions have been largely flat over the last few years. So the policy agenda which we've seen to drive those emissions reductions in the power sector hasn't been quite so evident elsewhere in the economy. Um, I would say that there's still opportunities in the power sector as well. So, for example, providing a route to market for onshore wind and solar technologies through the CFD is one sort of very quick win that I think um, most of the businesses would be aligned uh, in supporting. Providing certainty around the carbon price in the context of Brexit um, and EU, EU emissions trading scheme. This is, these are the types of policy frameworks that really matter to businesses if they're going to go on and make the, the type of investments which enables them to play, play the leadership role. Uh, and bringing their, comp their, uh, their customers with them. Um, we, we heard from, from their previous panel about the consistency of incentives. And that's obviously an issue for anyone making investments in the private sector as well as the public sector, and consistency around policies so that they know when they're in investing, for example, in a wind turbine, for example, that they know that they're going to not be disadvantaged in a couple of years if there's a policy change. Would you agree with that? Absolutely fundamental. So the time horizons that you're talking about in establishing these targets are up to 2050. So you need that policy certainty. You know, for example, the moment with which we transition from um, to, towards electric vehicles and making sure that that is set out far enough in advance, which enables the companies that are manufacturing those vehicles to invest accordingly. That's a you know prime example of of its importance. Um, I think. Um, we have seen a, a lot of chopping and changing in the policy environment um, over recent years. Um, at one one case in point, you know, if we're looking to establish a, a more ambitious target for emissions reductions, uh, as is uh, proposed in the bill, then carbon capture and storage is going to be absolutely fundamental to meeting that target. And um, since the support from the Westminster government was sort of withdrawn a, 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 withdrawn a few years ago. That hasn't been rebuilt in this with the same scale um, that would be necessary to see real progress in that area. So as we're looking forward to um, policy decisions over the next few years, that's a that's a gap that I think business would like to see addressed. Okay. And and Chris would you? Yeah. I mean, an, an overview. Obviously, your 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 organisation looks doesn't just look at the private and public sector in a silo. You you have an overview. Yeah, um, the responsibilities. SSN sort of lead on the public sector climate duties reporting, and I think, you know, uh, reiterate Tom's comment. The f what I scribbled down when you asked the question about public-private was partnership. You know, if we're going to build a building, we need some. You know, we generally have a private sector partner. Well, we will always have private sector partners in there. So. The, the relationship between the public and the private is crucial. Um, I think the examples that we can garner and uh, pull together through the climate change duties reporting helps to build the evidence base that private sector can dip into, um, public sector can dip into to, make, to understand what's possible um, to actually achieve the targets we're heading towards. I think the comment you made about the consistency of support is really, really crucial. We are on a long-term uh, journey with this um, so you know, the best will in the world you know, support for doing things over a couple of years is really useful and we'll do the level best to dealing uh, to to buy into that but some of the projects and some of the activities that public sector need to achieve might take several years to set up so if you've only got short-term support you don't really have the wherewithal to take them forward you get part way through and think oh, can't carry on with that. So we, we do need that long-term consistent support. Uh, we need to have good examples of what works. We also need to know what doesn't work um, so we can work in the right direction, I think. Okay. John Scott, would you like to come in? Um, I hear what you say about consistency of approach, and I perfectly well understand that coming from the business sector myself. But, um, but the vagaries of life and, and climate change and indeed government and political events not yet foreseen, uh, would consist could consistency of change be um, substituted by a direction of travel, a consistent direction of travel, because things might change over time, not unreasonably. Um, and, and I just wonder if, if that could just be kind of factored in, a consistency of approach to, to targets, although they might change over time. I don't know, I'm just being slightly devil's advocate. To some extent, they're, they're possibly two sides of the same coin, aren't they? You know, if we we know where we're heading for, so you have that consistency of approach, the technologies that come with it 
will change as time goes on, as we get better. Carbon capture and storage is a, a prime example. It's, I was always very skeptical, um, but having read a bit, bit more about it, it does seem to be a sensible approach to deal with it. And we've got some big holes in the ground as, uh, that we can, we can actually put the, the carbon underground and get rid of it. Um, so, yeah, I think a direction of travel is really important, having that sort of policy strategic direction to follow whether it's public or private. I think private sector, I suspect, would like a, un, to understand the consistent direction of travel as much as we do in the public sector. Uh, yes, just to reiterate to that. So I think the, setting the strategic direction over the long term, something that doesn't change, which is consistent regardless of political colour or um, where, where, whichever way you look at it, but um, a little bit more granularity about what the expectations on a sector by sector level would be go a long way to provide a bit more certainty for business. Yeah. yeah. Agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark Ruskell. Just following that, I'm wondering to what extent you all feel that the planning system is really delivering that kind of strategic focus for carbon reduction. I mean, particularly in the way that we plan out places. If, for example, Paul, you're, you're planning out a new hospital or Tom, one of your members, is planning out a new industrial estate, you know, are we, are we building in uh, opportunities there for, you know, low carbon transport, district heating, etc. To what extent is this being embedded in the planning system? Is that delivering the kind of certainty that we need around how we create low carbon places going forward? Do you engage with that? Mike. Um, um, I can respond to that for uh, um, obviously the council's perspective. We feel that um, planning has a huge obviously role to play in terms of influencing infrastructure, for instance, in, whether it's buildings or um, services. Uh, what I find uh, slightly frustrating is obviously we are not given enough power to, to, to then say to a uh, development you must have, for instance, district heating network infrastructure put in before you build anything else. You need to consider what is that carbon, you know, of the services you are going to provide. We don't ask these questions. All we ask is, what does your building look like? What's the footprint? You know, what buses are you going to put on? I mean, it's not taking it to the to the next level where we need to be. So it's looking at digital infrastructure. Um, how do we service that? well in, in, in future proofing again you don't want to dig a road over and over again for instance we have that a lot in the council and it, it's the homes what type of homes are we allowing them to build for instance under the planning is current planning guidance for instance again doesn't give room for innovation i don't think and and it, it's it's quite limiting in terms of powers that we have so i hope that in the future and in, in, in terms of the next 10 20 years th that transformational change can happen is how we look at how we deliver either health services, educational services, um, businesses, and people living in that same space, and how we look at that as a, you know whether it's a city, urban, or rural environment, or community environment. It doesn't seem to be cohesive as, as it is today, but I feel that there has to be step changes required in order to achieve where we want to be in 2050. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do still, and I feel planning has a very, very big role to play in it. I would love to engage with that because I think in terms of what I do, energy infrastructure, for instance, and it's very key to put that early doors in your design of whatever development you're making, be it a hospital or anything else, because it's too late if the building's up, um, pretty much. So that's where I'm coming from, and we're always trying to retrofit, and that costs a lot more money. And in terms of business, to retrofit any type of business, manufacturing, industry, hotels, services, anything, hospitals, that will cost you a lot more money tomorrow than if you would do if you put in the money today. So it would be good if the government can support us in terms of whatever that shape may be, uh, funding or otherwise, but I think it's very important to get the message across. Mm -hmm. yeah, just to add one point to that, so I think if you're commissioning um, services um, from the private sector, I think um, one of the things that prevents that uh, innovative dialogue to and more partners coming together is a tendency for some public sector bodies to procure on the basis of lowest cost. Um, rather than having that long-term view, looking for the innovation, um, if you speak to a lot of our members, that's the sort of major bugbear they have of um, public sector bodies, uh, as well as inconsistency of approach. I think we sort of accept that that's different areas have different priorities and businesses can respond to that. But um, if they're operating with different processes and approach, that it takes time for businesses to sort of learn the uniqueness of every single area. Okay. 
Why are they beam each other? A supplementary Thank question you, on that. It's a brief supplementary, particularly to um, yourself about Aberdeen, Council Mai, but, um, but others are, are welcome to, to comment as well. I mean, there is a planning bill going through the Parliament at the moment, and some of us have um, begun at stage two to um, have probing amendments about um, the planning structures and future proofing them for large infrastructure projects, as, as you'll know. And I'm wondering how you would see the, uh, a, a, a robust and good way um, of setting that at Scottish Government level. Possibly, th I'm not asking you to design an amendment on the <laughs> right now, but, but how, how could that happen while at the same time enabling local authorities um, to have the respect that they deserve to be shaping the future of, of their communities? Um, I, I think uh, the, um, the uh, local heat energy efficiency strategy is part of the energy efficiency route map that is put forward and, and the local authorities are going to be put into statutory um, obligations to do that. That should be taken into account in any future planning bill, for instance, is understanding how the councils and its partner communities is going to make a place be better in terms of living uh, area and, and providing services, etc., cetera, in, in, in terms of transport as well. So I, I don't think it's linked up well, and it seems to be in silo at the moment. So you've got different strategies still looking at different things, um, energy efficiency, for instance, and then there's planning, and then you know that's looking at place, green space, transport, not so much on energy efficiency and how low carbon uh, impacts on, on, on future use of that particular area. And obviously what I, I also um, try and engage with my colleagues, for instance, is people who look at flooding risk and, and, and understanding how do we build our buildings to, um, to, to take on climate change impacts, for instance. I haven't seen a new school yet that's considered that. I've asked the question, but um, you know, climate's getting warmer. What are we doing about that? It's very, yeah, it, it's as if it, it's because, like I say, it's not taken into the discussion very early stages. All those are not included in any of the planning requirement as it is. And, and, and if the bill in the future takes into account all these different impacts, I, you know, I think we are in a better way forward than where we are now. Thank you. Thank you. MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, <clears throat> convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Um, the previous RACI committee uh, in the last session of Parliament and, and this current declare committee um, have been very strong on, on public sector reporting. Uh, and we see that the majority of, of uh, reporting bodies agree that mandatory uh, climate change reporting is welcome, and it's also helped them uh, build on climate change actions. So I'd be keen to ask uh, members of the panel to, 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 to what extent is public sector reporting affecting real change across the public sector and beyond? Chris um, Mitchie. I think it's starting to work. It's, you know, we, as local authorities, we've been going through the climate change declaration report for since about 2007, and now we have the mandatory report, and that's now in into its third full year. Quite a lot of work to get the information together, but it does help to understand what we're doing and to understand what we're doing across uh, the broader sector, the, the whole of the public sector. And I think that's really crucial. I think it, it will need tweaking. Um, we now have worked with it for long enough to know what the good bits are and maybe where there's opportunities to improve. And that's something that I think would be good for Scottish Government maybe to look at. But I think it's really crucial that we do continue to report so we do develop that understanding of where we're going to because it's... In the past, yes, we had climate change, uh, CRC, uh, climate change reduction, but that's only gas and electricity. So it doesn't really look at the, the whole picture. What's really, really good, I think, about the climate change duties report is it's looking at what we're doing as individual organisations in terms of our emissions in buildings, but it's also looking at what our impacts are in the wider scope, how we actually govern things, which is one of the key issues about, I think, this discussion point is how the governance works within different organizations and then we can learn from the people who do it best um, so we can all hopefully head in the same direction but I think it's yes it's quite a lot of work but I think it's worthwhile work and I think we can get more out of it as we as our data sets develop and we start to interrogate those and find out the best things that are happening and make best use of the information we've secured I think it's well worthwhile. Okay, thanks. Paul Gray. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. MacDonald, I, I, I hold strongly to the view that public services are accountable and publicly accountable, and therefore there should, there should be no resistance to reporting. It may be difficult, it may be complicated, it, you know, we may not have all the data, but there should, no, there should not be resistance to reporting, because we are accountable to the public um, wh whom you are elected to serve. But I also think there are positive advantages to reporting. I mean, one of the things uh, that, that it brings out is when you can baseline and see that there are unexplained differences between different bodies. Some differences can be explained, but some can't. So if one, if one body's energy efficiency is 25% better than another's and they have roughly the same estate and footprint, then, then that's exposed something that you can very quickly begin to look at and tackle. Um, and if, some, if one public body is far ahead of many others, then again, are there some examples there? Are there things that we could be following through? Now, clearly, we can't um, begin to knock down buildings and replace them with, with, with new ones, you know, just on, on an ad hoc basis. But it does mean that when we're planning, we have a basis on which to look at best practice. And I think the points that have been made about partnership with the private sector are important in that context, because clearly, we're going, when we're talking about capital infrastructure, we are more than likely to be engaging with different parts of the, the private sector, whether, whether it's on, on civil engineering or implementing digital services, whatever it may be. And if we've got some good baselines that say, well, this is, this is the best of the best, but I would also like to link it to the point that Mr. Scott raised earlier. It's also about forward trajectories. It's not just about what are we doing just now, but if this is our baseline now, where would we like to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time and planning ahead for that? So there are probably um, uh, areas in which reporting will be difficult. There are probably areas in which reporting may expose people like me to criticism, but I don't think that makes it wrong. I think it's absolutely essential that we do this and do it thoroughly, and that we do it in a way that is publicly meaningful and can be compared. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. I, I'd like to just follow up on that um, in terms of uh, the fact that um, what both yourself, Paul, and Chris have been highlighting in terms of the public sector climate change duties. And uh, as we all know, they are now mandatory, and that was a, a difficult process, but that's where we are. I, I personally believe that's the right place to be. It was difficult for some of the smaller organisations to... And, and indeed some of the larger ones without naming and shaming to, to get to where they should have been at that stage, but there's been a lot of progress. But I do wonder the degree to which um, yourselves or anyone else on the panel think that um, there, there is a place for penalties once this is really bedded in. If the examples you were giving, Paul, of, of those that have a similar estate, for instance, of buildings are not doing what others are, you know, with, with warnings, but is there a place for penalties? Um, maybe, but let, 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 me, let me say what, what, what I think. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, I, I entirely accept the question, and it's a fair and reasonable one. Let, let me put it like this. Um, we've, we've been retrofitting uh, some of our energy centres to take advantage of the latest energy efficiency technology and, uh, the technologies. And a recent example is one that we did within our three main acute uh, sites in Tayside. Um, it was procured under an energy performance contract, so there was no upfront cost to the board. And we put in latest um, technology, combined heat and power at nine wells and two other uh, sites. We've saved over 12,700 tonnes of CO2, and that's equivalent to almost 30% of Tayside's total energy emissions. What's that got to do with penalties? Well, in my mind, that, that, that's saving CO2 uh, emissions, also saving money. Um, I, I could give you a similar example from NHS Lothian, where it's been quantified at a saving, I think, of £2.7 million, pounds, as well as the efficiency and so forth. So... So to me, I would start with the positive advantages and say, um, look, he here are some examples of, of, of health boards that have been able to um, reduce their carbon emissions and save money. But there has to come a point where I might say to these health boards, 
do you know what? You, you've had five years to think about this now. So we're going to set your budgets going, going ahead on the basis that you will make these savings. Now, is that a penalty? Well, um, uh, but, but it's, let's put it this way. There's a big incentive to make the saving, and there has to come a point where there's no incentive to avoid making it. So that's the way I would look at this. Okay. Richard Lyle. Um, we've got 32 councils in Scotland and many other public bodies, too many to mention. Aberdeen City Council called for a stronger public body duties in its submission with a desire to see strengthened frameworks for and expectations on leadership, accountability, target setting, action planning and reporting across other tiers of public sector. What would this mean in practice? Maybe Aberdeen first. I will probably try to answer that the best I can. Um, what we think is um, having it mandatory is well and good. It establishes, like you say, a baseline as well and to see how you are performing in terms of a comparison or as a standalone. However, if where does that go to in terms of information, data or improvement? So uh, all the penalties were spoken about, what would we think is maybe we should look at why are other, you know, some of the authorities not showing um, a reduction and, and understanding and, and giving them the necessary, if you like, assistance in terms of improving that. So penalties not necessarily might help because that's just a monitoring. It doesn't maybe resolve what actually is the issue. So that, that's one thing. In terms of then um, accountability and leadership, we find that that is very important. If anything to do with climate change, energy efficiency um, in particular, we need a clear direction in terms of leadership, in terms of the consistency across all the different departments within the council. You know, Everybody needs to understand where that sits. Um, so that's where we're coming from in terms of the leadership, because what we find a lot of this is it almost like a silo effect in terms of it's, it's one particular department, be it planning or otherwise, it's taking on delivery of the climate change reporting, for instance, and the others just feed numbers in. So there's no accountability, as you can see there. So um, there's no answer yet, but I, well, that's what we think, that there should be some development in terms of who ultimately is going to be responsible for those information that's been submitted and who monitors that, who, who looks at any improvement or otherwise, and, and, and then it's up to maybe SSA to try and assess those who are underperforming in whatever way um, that's where we're coming from. Um, so th we see it slightly differently because a bit like the CRC experience, um, and a lot of people report and pay the carbon and that's it for the year. Um, and, um, and it could be the situation. So uh, because there is no incentive or penalties or whatever, the, the, you know, it didn't deliver, I thought, what it initially set out to do. And I feel if this is going down the same route, then it might just Obviously, CRC is changing the carbon reduction you know, uh, commitment. So that's where we're looking at it. It, it. We just didn't want it to become that, a, a similar a situation where the CRC is at the moment. Yeah. Um, I th the, the point you were making, I think it's, it is, we do need to improve the, the governance side of it. Um, we, you know, we have really good examples of good political leadership We've got good senior management leadership, but sometimes then the delivery is down so far down the organisation, it's not actually getting right the way through. And I think it's really important. I think the, one of the key benefits, I guess, from the reporting side of things is being able to pick up the good examples and for people to learn from those, to share the experience where there are weaknesses, speak to people who are getting the job right and find out what works and what doesn't work. And that's as big a job as putting the numbers down is disseminating the information and for us to all understand what works, what doesn't work. Um, and there has been, you know, in the delivery of the reports, you know, there's some organisations haven't done so well, but there's been some really good sharing experience. Uh, I think NHS were possibly one of the examples where they, they helped another organisation get themselves up to speed. And so there is that, you know, that sort of natural inclination, I think, across the public sector to share experience and to find out what works, what doesn't work, and then to hopefully for us all to use the best examples and to go forward as most effectively as effectively as we can. What is your view on leadership structures and commitment to delivery across the public sector and communication of a vision through strategic planning through organisations and 
Do we really have clear route maps for what is required of the public and private sector, and are these being translated across all areas of organisations? Probably not yet. I think we're on a journey. Um, my mention, you know, local heat energy efficiency strategies, that will be one of the, the mechanisms we use to get an understanding of where we need to go across local authority areas and how different partners within those areas uh, tie into that process. I think we're heading in the right direction, but I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Um, so it, it is a learning experience. And again, back to the reporting, it, it gives us a means of recording where we're up to and where we need to go in the future. The panel, uh, what is your view of the governance body model proposed by the climate change plan? response to the points that Mr Lyle has been making, um, if I may give this committee uh, some credit, one of, one of the things being invited to come to this committee prompted me to do was to go back and look at the extent to which uh, these the issues that the committee is uh, discussing today had been uh, discussed at chief executive level in the NHS. Um, and. Uh, the simple fact is not not very often, not never, but not very often. Now, that doesn't mean they're not discussed in boards at chief executive level, but I have a monthly meeting with the chief executives of all the health boards. And this month, the 14th of uh, November, I've therefore asked that um, the uh, official report from today's session and the background papers and the other um, ancillary uh, documentation be put on the agenda for that meeting, because I think to respond to Mr. Lyle's point, we do have. We act, I actually do think we have reasonably sound governance within the NHS. It, it's there. It's not all in the future. It's there now, and it's happening. It's been there since 2015. We've, you know, we've 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 got our um, sustainability action branding and campaign, and that was launched in September. So we are we are taking action, and we can point to some benefits from it. But I do want to assure myself that the the health boards collectively are taking um, action that is consistent and also looking at the partnership opportunities that exist so that we're not we're not viewing this in a siloed way. So I, I, I think you know the the very fact that this committee is taking an interest is in itself useful in prompting I think some leadership action. Um, in answer to Dick Lyle's other question around the the governance arrangements. Does anyone get any points to make on that? The... Tom just, just one one point, um, <clears throat> not close to sort of the public reporting side of it, but the uh, practice from the private sector, obviously, is sort of very much buy into the what what gets measured gets changed. So, um, in the spirit of reporting, that seems a, a positive direction of travel. Um, and it's particularly if that conversation is one that's being had at the board level and not just um, within the sort of delivery function of, of the organisation within a business. Um, we would say from the business experience that when it comes to reporting, there's um, sometimes you can become less transparent by reporting on more things. Um, so the kind of profligacy of you know more and more things that businesses are being asked to report on, does that actually become give more transparency and accountability to consumers and are we reporting in a way which enables them to interact with that conversation, which is perhaps as much a question for the public sector reporting side as, as it is for the private sector. Um, and the final point would be you know, sort of relevant to what I, what I said previously, um, are we incentivizing the behaviors within different parts of industry to deliver on those plans? I think at the sort of strategic long-term target um, level, yes, we've, we've, and the build goes even further uh, in making that clear. But on a sector by sector basis, what's required of um, industry uh, year to year, those kind of granular plans haven't been set up yet. And I think it's a dialogue which needs to take place between um, government and industry to make that happen. Richard Lyle. I, I'm sorry, I'm not having a, a, a pop at you, Tom, before I ask this question. Um, but I, I, I just can't miss asking this question. Do CBI members have any concerns about climate change having an effect on their profits? 
Um, it depends which members you talk about. I think the the most common. Um, it doesn't feel like a pop, by the way. That seems like a perfectly valid question. Uh, the most the most common response we get from people who want to talk about climate change with the CBI is that they recognise that you know becoming more innovative in green technology is a business opportunity rather than a business risk. Um, Basically, climate change and, and new technology could actually mean more profit. It can do. It can do. Absolutely. I think, I mean, there are caveats to that, obviously. Businesses operate in a global marketplace. If you're in an energy uh, intensive industry, for example, and you're operating on a global basis and your competition is in China or in India who aren't subject to the same kind of regulatory regimes are, are we are and the, you know, and that kind of um, uh, enterprise is very uh, mobile, then, you know, you can see that there's challenges, immediate challenges um, with some climate change initiatives, those are not insurmountable. If you have a long-term policy framework which enables businesses to adjust, if you couple the domestic ambition with international diplomacy, which helps other countries to meet those same standards, then um, you have a good chance of, um, of appealing to that segment of the, of the business community as well. Thank you. Right, Ruskell. Just go back to public sector governance again. Um, you've got uh, mandatory reporting. Uh, you've got kind of you know sharing good practice and kind of nudging each other along. W what about actual carbon budgeting? Because um, I'm aware that Aberdeen Shire Council does this. They set a, a carbon budget. Uh, they link actions to targets and reduction of carbon emissions from their uh, assets and services. And that's reported against each year, and it's linked to the financial budget. So what the council is spending and uh, commissioning uh, is linked to that. Is, is there anything sort of beyond just seeing how you, you're doing that actually goes into the budgeting uh, and is actually explicit in terms of financial planning within the organisations that you represent? Um, as you stated there, Aberdeen Shire is carrying out the carbon budgeting for a few years now. Um, in the city, uh, Aberdeen City, we, we, we feel at the time uh, we didn't have the uh, adequate resources to, to, to do that because we, we looked at it, obviously there were presentations uh, at the time it was looked at, uh, we didn't have the skills or the resources in order to, to deliver properly a carbon budgeting linking to our financial, um, obviously, um, reports. That in itself is quite resource intensive. Um, I've spoken to some of them who are actually doing it. it is, because it's almost like another piece of financial reporting that you got to do, and it's I had to link and everything else exactly like you say, different budget lines, etc. So um, we we decided to approach it, if you like, in a more um, traditional way in terms of if you could reduce your energy, right, and you could set a budget for energy, forecast it well, reduce your energy spend, your carbon spend should also reduce. And in terms of monitoring that, obviously the remit will fall into, uh, uh, in, in my team for instance, to make sure that happens and that's reported, the governance is there and I need to explain any increases. And, and this is where, um, where I think the climate change reporting um, sometimes fails to, to pick up is the absolute figures, for instance, do not reflect how you use a building, weather patterns, um, that kind of issues that we've got, occupational changes. And we feel sometimes it's difficult to put that in a financial report because a financial report does not take all those numbers into account. It's absolute figures. Why are you up 3% say of whatever it is? So uh, that's why sometimes I feel, although carbon budgeting is good, it might not capture the, the reasons, for instance, um, and, and actions that need to be put in place to manage why um, you're not meeting your targets or your uh, your um, consumption has gone up that year or whatever the reasons are. And that's why um, the city has decided to focus on actually reducing your energy either through measures, actions, or you know actually delivering projects that do that. And of course, you've got to report it in a governance way um, um, through the existing uh, governance route. Mm -hmm. yep. I suppose this, this falls into uh, one of my um, categories of uh, just because it's hard, it doesn't mean you shouldn't think about it. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we would never do anything hard because we wouldn't want to think about it. So I, I would like to make two offers to the committee, if I may. Um, the, the first is that um, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport has committed to publishing a capital investment strategy by the end of this financial year, and I think we should reflect on that point in terms of how we, how we might 
describe our strategy and how that might relate to carbon budgeting. The second is that, um, uh, although I'm principally here today in my in the part of my role that is Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, I'd be happy to, uh, as a member of Scottish Government's corporate board, um, get um, a brief note to the committee on the, the Scottish Government's uh, current position on carbon budgeting, um, if that would be helpful to the committee. Yes, yes it would. Yeah. Okay. Claude Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. It was just to ask if there were any views um, on the, um, the governance body model proposed by the Climate Change Plan in relation to, um, to the public sector and whether, um, whether that is something that has come across any of your desks and if you have any views on it or if it's too early to say because I think it has just reported for the first time but the the stakeholder engagement has raised a, a significant number of questions, which we don't have time to go into today, but I'm just wondering if there were comments on, on it in a, in a broad sense. Paul Gray. Thank you, uh, Convener. I, I should have been a little clearer in my response to Mr Lyle. Uh, my intention is to, in taking the, um, this to the uh, NHS Board Chief Executives to discuss with them how that governance body aligns with or does not align with the governance arrangements we've, we've got in place at the moment. So in other words, you know, do, what are the merits of the, the, the proposal and how, how would it work with what we've got? Um, I will confess to being keen not to dismantle something that we've only had in place since 2015 unless there is you know, clear evidence that there is something better that we could be doing. But again, I'd be happy um, after that meeting, which is, as I say, fairly, I've said fairly soon, um, I'd be happy to come back to the committee with, with some, some better formed views on that once we've had an opportunity to discuss it. The Scottish Government um, responded to our committee saying, and I quote, that the final plan, that's a climate change plan, sets out the key functions of a governance body which will oversee the implementation and monitoring of the climate change plan. So it is a very important aspect of it that we will now have a monitoring body and that and there's buy-in, I, I perhaps should have said, beyond the, pu the public sector, you know, with the private sector and all the sectors. So I don't know if there's any further comments about whether that's come to your attention at the moment. Chris? Probably not sufficiently up to speed to make a meaningful comment, but I think actually having a governance body formally tied into things, I think will make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't really comment any more detail. I have read, you know, read about it, but I, I just mm -hmm. can't pull it straight to the front of my mind at the moment. But I think it's useful that we've, you know, we need governance at all levels, at the appropriate level, at the right levels as well. Any other comments? Um, I haven't read it in, in fully, so I cannot comment in, in totality. <laughs> um, so um, I, I agree that the, you know the governance should, I think, overarch the private sector and the public sector, and, and it has to be some level of consistency. Um, you know, in terms of maybe re reporting, what are you reporting? What are uh, the, the sectors? You know, it to be def defined in a clear way. What actually we're monitoring? What are we evaluating? And what's the output of that? Because I think at the moment now, there is a lot of, um, if you like, um, being put on to the public sector in terms of reporting and all that. I'm, I'm not saying that the private sector is, is, is behind on that, but I feel there's a lot of catching up to do. And I feel this is where I think a proper governance route that, that is um, a level playing field, I think would be fairer for us. And even within the public sector, the NHS, um, you know, this, this functions may be slightly different than how a, a local government sort of um, will function. So it's understanding, you know, we should have an overarching governance that I think a level playing field is, is what I would like to see. Okay. John Scott. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested to hear what you say that, uh, particularly uh, Paul Gray saying that, you know, meeting with chief executives and will discuss this further and not having discussed it hugely up till now, which I think is probably a very candid and welcome uh, statement. And and I, I do wonder if uh, so that, that's the context of the question I want to ask. And, and do you think there's a lot more room to, to achieve uh, targets, as it were, on a voluntary basis rather than a regulatory basis for in as much as we have heard people propose that the only future that is left now is to everything to be legislated for and driven in that way because 
the voluntary basis will not deliver. So would you like to discuss that briefly? So since 1990, NHS Scotland estates energy consumption has reduced by over 38% and greenhouse gas emissions have reduced by over 49%, and that's well ahead of national targets. And my point, Mr Scott, therefore, is it is possible to make good progress and not simply to um, you know, aim at the targets as though they were a limit rather than a target. You, 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 can, you can exceed them. Um, I think there is, there is and remains considerable willingness to do better, but it's equally the case that um, the future is more challenging and many of the quick wins, I, you know, I think, have already been uh, taken a, a, into account. Um, you know, you're asking me about whether, whether we ought to um, you know, go for more mandation or not. Um, and I suppose my safe answer is that's clearly a matter for the Parliament. But um, my other answer, in part, I think, uh, given to other committee members, was there is very clear evidence that, this is, that, 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 that more is possible. And there is very clear evidence that where boards have invested uh, meaningfully in this, that, that change does happen and savings are secured. So, so um, the most recent example from NHS Lothian, among many other things, has been delivered at no net cost to NHS Lothian. So, in other words, they've, they've improved their performance in emissions, they've improved uh, their performance in efficiency, and there is no net cost to them in doing so. So I think the path for me has to be making sure that the best practice is clear and exemplified. And as I said in a previous response, that where people are declining to follow that best practice, then whether you call it a penalty or whether you call it a, an incentive, there is, there is an incentive in the system to do it and there is a disincentive not to do it. However, I mean, some, you know, some buildings that we have, for example, were designed for 25 and 30 year use, and therefore um, the, the, the capacity to retrofit is limited. So we would also have to ask ourselves what mandation would actually produce. Um, you know, if, 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 you, if you mandate um, an improvement in energy efficiency, for example, um, that, that will be most readily delivered in, in newer buildings or new builds, and, and, and you, you know, there'll be there for a disproportionate skewing. That said, I did give the example of Girvan Community Hospital, which in and of itself has um, delivered a 3% uh, reduction in, in the Ayrshire and Arden's overall CO2 emissions in, you know, by, by, by actions in one site. So... Um, I, I, I think I would want to understand very clearly, before giving any view at all, um, what, what mandation would really be, uh, what it would mean and what it would produce. Because if it simply produces a lot of per perverse incentives, then it could take us off the trajectory we're on onto something else. I also think we'd need to engage very closely with um, our uh, you know, partners in the, in the private sector to understand what they could actually deliver, because there's no point in mandating something that can't be delivered. To hear from Tom Thackeray as well, of course. I, I think I'll go along with that entirely. I think it's, um, you need to have, I mean, my, my comments at the outset were, you know, how do you make targets affordable and achievable and a quite strict regulatory approach at a headline level um, it's probably not the way to secure the investment which is needed to, to make those swift gains. I would say that on a more sort of granular case by case basis, the private sector is very much up for um, a dialogue with public sector partners about how you, um, how you improve the regulatory landscape so that it does encourage investment. A good example would be in building standards, for example. So the great example for Germany, where the German house building industry has partnered with the German government <coughs> to set standards, which they're then basically writing the building standards for the BRICS countries at the moment, which is a massive export opportunity born out of a regulatory approach with the private and the public se sector working together. It's also evident in things like disruptive technologies, so drone maintenance of... Uh, wind turbines, for example. At the moment, the regulatory approach doesn't enable businesses to invest in those type of areas, but with the right partnership with the public sector, that could be, become very possible. Okay, thank you. 
Right. I've got another question for you, um, which is related, although different, and, and just about the targets themselves. And to what extent does the 90% by 2050 target in the bill provide a, a clear long-term marker for driving investment uh, innovation and change? Would increasing this to net zero increase the drive for investment innovation and change? For, I mean, is it easier to communicate and achieve buy-in for a target of net zero? What's your view on that? Should we be going for net zero, or are you happy with a 90% target, or which is easier to sell? Tom's back, Ray. Um, I'd, I'd basically repeat the same same answer. Basically, we're after achievability and affordability. I think you know there's a lot of talk around net zero at the moment. Businesses want to be in that dialogue, and if the climate science says that we need to be going for a, a net zero target, then then let's have a conversation of what policies we need to put in place to to reach that. But wouldn't we rather set things that we're going to achieve rather than things which seem at this stage we don't have the we don't have the scientific backing for from a committee on climate change point of view, although they're looking at it, looking at it now. Um, so let's wait um, until we get the evidence back from that. Would be the first uh, first point of call, and then let's acknowledge the fact that there, as I said in my opening remarks, there are significant policy gaps in achieving current targets. We're going to need to fill those gaps to meet 90 percent, and we're going to need to go even further than that to meet net zero. So there needs to be some realism along with the uh, ambition. Thank you. And do others want to comment on that? Paul Gray. Thank you. Um, I think there's an important... I think, first of all, I agree wholeheartedly with the point, which is let's go where the evidence points us. Um, but there's also an important point about our ability to be influential internationally. Uh, we, we spoke about other countries that had different regulatory frameworks and maybe um, that could be disadvantageous to us in terms of um, some of our commercial activities. Well, it will be hugely important that if we wish to be influential, we will need to be pursuing targets that are demonstrably um, world leading. Now, whether that's 90% or net zero, I, 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 I don't have the scientific knowledge to um, opine. But what I, what I do believe is that the more we can do that can be exemplified publicly, and by that I don't just mean the public sector but the private sector as well, the more influential we will be uh, elsewhere in the world when we're talking about the terms of trade uh, that, that, that we might want. So the, the, there is um, clearly to me, if you like, a diplomatic advantage in, in thinking carefully about what what stance we want to take here and what position we want to represent. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, clearly, if we started today and aim for 2050 and just had a, a straight line reduction, that would be one approach and it's kind of what we're doing. Alternatively, if we did nothing whatsoever until one day before the target in 2050, we'd still meet the target, but we'd actually have emitted twice the amount of greenhouse gas in that period of time, because the two triangles in the graph are the same. Uh, so therefore, the intermediate targets are designed to take us on a line rather than postpone. But there is a huge advantage to the agenda in early action that reduces the amount of carbon and other greenhouse gases emitted, and in carbon in particular, which endures in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, the less you put out there, the better. What are we doing that helps that agenda, or is that uh, too difficult? Chris was nodding. Chris, I don't you? know whether it's necessarily... Well, I think it is very, very difficult. It's going to be hugely challenging. I think actually the new targets that are coming out, the climate change bill, you know, when they, the first iteration when we're for public sector, uh, we were looking at sort of 90%, 96% decarbonisation and something. It was uh, ambitious and challenging and probably impossible. Um, where we are now at 53% is still ambitious and challenging, but it gives us something to work towards. Um, and working from life figures as well, rather than baselines which yeah whilst useful um you know we don't it's so i think so the, the, the 
going to be, we will probably come back to this a little bit more. I'm asking a very narrow question so that we can make progress. Um, just whether there is scope for your organisations to do better than the line that is currently being sought. Potentially. Because of the, yeah. Potentially. I think there are still, you know, depends on how far you are as an organisation. A lot of organisations have hit all, you know, what's termed the low-hanging fruit. Others have got further to go on that. So there are good opportunities still to take. Um, but we need to take those opportunities and work on it. Rattle along, see if others say the same thing. Tom? Well, whatever. Um, can I just say that although the private sector is concerned about uh, the cost of um, going towards net zero and 90% by 2050, what is important is to understand the financial modelling that we're doing is looking at purely maybe the cost of it and not putting a value to the benefits of it. And I think that's important in a financial model. It, it, it's it's sometimes the health benefits, for instance, how do you quantify that and how do you project that to 2050? How do you take that health implication and, and how, what are the savings you can achieve in terms of health services, for instance? So I think it's unfair to just say that, you know, whether it's financially viable today to do it, but we need to include in that financial modelling is what else, you know, other sectors that can benefit from that, in particular health, and I think that's a very key point. And the cost of technology um, today may be prohibitive for whatever reason, and that inhibits maybe innovation. But this is where I think government, again, has a role to play in terms of maybe um, for the early adopters, you know, they've, they've had the LCITP programme and everything else like that, but we need to have more of these programmes that encourage innovation and for industry then to be excited to be part of it by putting out very small pots of money in terms of you know, innovation schemes out there that may be limited again to maybe public sector to, to, to get funding to. I, I think it limits that. So if, if you increase more, um, how do you say, encouragement maybe in, in the early adopters to try and push and accelerate innovation, then in, in the next 10 years, the technology that we thought would be too expensive today may actually be viable. And, and, and that's very key, I think. Today, I think we're, we're just not enough being done to, to, to encourage that innovation. Um, and then, obviously, we can get the benefits of that in 2040, 2050. The other key point here is digitali digitalization. And I think a lot more work can be done there in terms of how we deliver services that way. And, and I think there's huge opportunities there that um, will help towards achieving our targets. It's, it's how we deliver services differently. And I think that step change I said earlier, it's, it's key to do that you know, you know, to make sure it's transformational change we need to do and, and, and to think differently of how we do things. And I think we can achieve it by doing these things. Mark Ruskell. Can I move to public sector financing models? I mean, you know, we've obviously had tranches of PFI, um, PPP in the past. We've got uh, new models that have come on since then, such as Hubco. Um, do, do these models actually incentivise um, reduction of carbon, energy efficiency, the best technology, the best solutions? Are there, are there issues in the way that we procure uh, these kind of assets and, and contracts and deliver uh, buildings and other services in a way which um, you know, perhaps doesn't deliver uh, the best carbon value, if you like, for, for society? Paul Gray. Good question, and I don't know the whole answer to it, Mr. Ruskell. But I, I, what I will say is this: that, that certainly the way that we, we as I, I mentioned, our capital investment group earlier, the way that we we run that, um, th there are there are standards that that need to be met before a business case or an investment appraisal would be signed off. And I've not so far had anything put to me in the things I've been asked to sign off that say you know, the, the non-profit distributing model or the hub co-model is somehow inimical to meeting these targets. Now, so that's what, that, you know, that's one half of the, the, the answer to your question. Um, what I don't have a sufficient answer to, but will be happy to get it for the committee, is the extent to which these models are actually driving innovation. So, so in other words, what I am saying to you today is they're not getting in the way of it. But you're asking, are they driving it? And I would, I would need to check in order to give a factual answer to the committee, and I'd like to do that. Okay. Yeah. Mohammed. Um, the 
councils um, across Scotland have looked at the NDEE, which is the Non-Domestic Energy Efficiency Framework, which is a way of procuring um, energy efficiency works in, in, in retrofit, um, as well as potentially new builds. And what we find is, because it has an element of um, monitoring and verification put onto the contractors, we find this actually almost um, a good learning curve, because previously in either PPP or PFI contracts, there's been never put place in terms of um, a responsibility or accountability to the contractor at the end of year, uh, after the completion of build, basically they build, they design and build, and uh, they walk away, and then depends on how they use it, could be a DBFM or, or just a DB contract. But having um, the, the uh, monitoring and verification process as part of the NDE is very important because they have to prove in 12 months, for 24 months, the calculations in terms of carbon saving, energy efficiency measures they've installed, whether it's innovation or technology um, led, has delivered. And I think that is a huge improvement in terms of, for us anyway, in local authorities, it gives us a bit more, um, 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 if you like, a method and governance route that we can contractually say to them, Mr. Contractor, you haven't delivered, and, and these you, know, you need to prove if you have delivered, and, and, and that is very important. And I think going forward, I think a lot of contracts need to have that verification monitoring process as part of the contract and not an add-on, um, if you like, at the end of the contract. And I think it's very important. Yeah. Okay. Tom Thackeray. Um, just sort of reiterating, reiterating a point I made earlier, I think the, the broad perception from industry when it comes to sort of engaging in the PPP is that um, they're uh, more often not competing based on cost rather than value. Um, we, did a, we did a survey over the summer, which I'm happy to circulate to the committee, which bears that out. So 60% and 65% feel that that's, um, that's the case. Um, some of that, you know, speaking to public authorities, is a, there's a lot of blame shifted towards uh, European public procurement regulations as a, as a source of that. Um, I think in reality, um, contracting authorities have much more flexibility than they realise, um, but perhaps with Brexit there is an opportunity to uh, look at that in greater depth uh, and um, start to tackle some of those challenges which businesses see. Okay. Right, we'll move on. John no. Scott. Thank you very much, um, don't, Unsurprisingly, I um, want to deal with the costs of all of this. Um, and the financial memorandum outlines that additional costs to meet a 90% target of around £13 billion will be faced between 2030 and 2050. It does not outline to whom these costs will fall or who, by whom they should be met or the timescales for these costs to be incurred. So what economic modelling of the costs and benefits of mitigating and adapting to climate change has been carried out by the organisations represented on the panel and how much investment by the private sector could be expected to accompany these costs or not? Discuss. What, what do you think about your share of the £13 billion of course? Um, I think one of the challenges I guess we've all faced is that energy inflation tends to be significantly higher than RPI. Um, the advice we're getting from the Scottish Government in terms of, say, gas prices the next year is going to be 18, or over the, these two years, they'll be up by 18%. We're on about 3% RPI. So even though we might get the savings from doing things, we're not necessarily getting the cash savings from them. We'll get the carbon will go down, but the cash might not. So it's so when we're talking about investing massive amounts of money, um, it is very very challenging. I think it's one of the questions that has been raised right the way through the, the whole climate change process is how do we get the money together to do this? Um, certainly from the local authority sector, and I'm sure it'll be the same with the health board. We are financially very very challenged on that, and the issue is always going to be is where do you invest that money? Is it for education? Is it for social care? Is it for carbon? And I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but it is very, very difficult to get the sort of climate change high enough up the agenda, although it makes sense to do it, and we all understand the health benefits of a, clean, of a, a better climate, you know, less heat problems, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but it is, I think it is probably the big, you know, one of the biggest questions about this whole agenda, is how we actually deliver that financially. Views of others, we, we know it's going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that there's, I mean, that energy cost dynamic that, that Chris has described is, should be an incentive for private sector companies to invest more in the kind of things, but there is market failure there. So you can, you can say that they should be investing, look at the energy prices, but I think before, before that, um, apart from some industries, before that situation becomes critical, there needs to be a nudge, whether that be in the form of best practice campaigns or showing up works, um, there needs to be a nudge of the private sector in that direction. Sort of to, on the more negative side, I suppose, I'm not sure of that 13 billion pound figure takes into account the changing tax base that comes account comes with these changes as well. So for example, if we're moving to electric vehicles and um, less less money coming through from, from fuel duty, for example, how does that play out in the public finances? So you need a much broader conversation about how you know, how the economy is financed in um, within 12 years time. So it uh, needs to get into that discussion fairly quickly. We're unclear as to where that figure has come from. Mm. At least I'm unclear, maybe others are aware, but uh, how that figure has been arrived at. But nonetheless, assuming that the scale, even if, it's, even if the figure itself might be open to variation, if the scale is somewhere between 10 and 15 billion pounds of cost to be incurred, how are we to afford it? Paul, I expect you to have the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Scott. <laughs> well, um, so this t today, uh, 2018, we, we're as far away from um, 1986 as we are from 2050. And you'd asked if you'd asked in 1986 what the technologies of today would be, some people would have got it right, and many would have got it wrong. So one of the issues, of course, is we're trying to imagine what the world will be like in 2050 in order to make these estimates. I think that the significance of the 13 billion is simply this. It's not easy. That, that you know, as you rightly say, it could be 10 billion, it could be 15 billion, but it's not half a million pounds. So it's, it's going to be, this is, this is significant and it requires thought. What I can tell you, for example, is that um, if the national electricity and gas grids were fully decarbonised, then that would um, save us the cost of retrofitting our energy infrastructure to be net zero carbon to the tune of £300 million. But of course, that, mean, that needs you to have two assumptions. One is, will these grids be decarbonised? And secondly, will all our infrastructure that would have to be retrofitted still be here in five years' time? And clearly some of it won't. But again, it's possible to make calculations about what it would cost. The risk of the calculations is if they're based on the world in 2050 simply being what it is now but decarbonized as though that as though and that's not a realistic future to imagine so the way we deliver services the the way in which people travel um the way in which um they think about themselves and their health and their lives will all be very different in 2050 from now there are some there are some important imperatives though so for for example if if um uh, you know, temperatures rise over time and uh, to the extent that they could, there'll be an increase in the prevalence of what's called vector-borne disease associated with species migration. In English, species will come to this country that aren't here just now and they'll carry disease with them and that'll have an impact on the population. Therefore, it's not just about the 13 billion euro plus or minus, it's about what it would cost you not to do it. Now, clearly, even if Scotland was the absolutely world-leading exemplar, others would have to be following in train, otherwise these vector-borne diseases wouldn't stop at Carlisle. Um, you know, so, so I, think, I think there's something, again, going back to this point about being, be, being nationally and internationally influential in the way that we approach this. Um, so there are calculations that can be done. They clearly have a massive degree of, you know, they have a very big confidence interval. You, 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 but but what, you, what, what I think we're saying to ourselves is, if we're serious about this, we're going to have to plan for it and a plan to afford it. And if we're not willing to do that, 
there are implications and impacts which are much more profound than you know, whether you can afford to run a health service or not. They affect the whole of the population. So, so that's a partial answer. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Um, Thank you. Yep, th thanks. John. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, actually, this uh, last weekend I was in Aberdeen and and saw for myself, to be honest, for the first time the the scale. Not that I have never been to Aberdeen before. My grand was from there, but and I, and I know it quite well. But I looked very specifically at the scale of the oil industry, supply ships, and all all that side of things, and also um, from the perspective of low carbon, hearteningly at wind turbines which were going out, um, ready to go out to the offshore industry in, in the bay itself. Um, in, in the submission from uh, Aberdeen City Council, in relation to the, um, the uh, targets in the bill as they stand at the moment, um, the comment was made in your written submission, um, how compatible are these targets with um, those of our present uh, economy there's still a heavy emphasis on fossil fuel sectors. And um, you may well know that there has been a recent report modelling the potential of Scotland's offshore industry to 2050 by Aberdeen University, which has estimated there could be 17 million barrels of oil equivalent still to be extracted. This industry has an educated and well-paid workforce, which of course goes without saying. How does maximising economic recovery for this industry fit with reducing carbon emissions, if indeed it does, and what of a just transition for workers if it doesn't? I don't know who would like to... I think Tom Thack is the obvious person to... And to possibly Aberdeen person. as well, yeah, since yeah. it's... Um, yeah. um, I, I think specifically there's you know, huge expertise and supply chain capability um, in Scotland for um, oil and gas industry that needs to be celebrated and needs to be sort of a managed transition as we sort of um, a, a, as we get the most out of the resources that we have in this in this part of the country I think we shouldn't um, and that that's a sort of real honest conversation that needs to have be happen with Scottish government and Westminster government and and industry um, I think there's massive opportunities in um, new forms of energy generation, though, and particularly relevant to Scotland. You know, we know the um, prowess that we've um, that we've got in terms of, of wind power in the companies that exist here, and the supply chain opportunities that are there as well. So I don't think I think um, there has to be a transition, and I think the industry accepts that. I think um, you um, we're not exploiting the. Uh, new generation cap capability that we have through renewables just yet, particularly because we don't have that, those routes to markets through things like the CFD. And I think if you sent those signals early enough, that enables parts of industry to invest, which could pick up some of the slack in terms of the overall economy um, and its contribution. Um, but you need to have those signals set early so that, um, that, that change to the CFD is an absolutely critical one for the UK generally, but the, for the Scotland specifically. Could I ask you if that's a conversation that within CBI um, is is happening in a robust way, perhaps, if you don't mind me asking? Yes, uh, indeed, it's happening in a re robust way. We're making representations to um, all parts of government to make sure that that's the case. And from the point of view of um, Aberdeen, I think we're running out of time, so through the convener briefly. Please. Okay, I'll try to be quick to respond to your um, um, question. I, it, is, your it is, it's a very large question. Yeah. Um, in, in, in terms of oil and gas in Aberdeen, as you can see from the supply ships and all that, it, industry is still there, but obviously it's a bit of a downturn at the present time. And although there's discovery of oil fields and all that, we must take to cognizance that there is a cost to take that gas or whatever it is out of there, supply it over, the refine it, you know, so it's all that cost. And then there's carbon, you know, and, and then all that other costs associated with it. So in, in terms of then the the people that are already doing that, there is, as you know, in, in, in Aberdeen, we are trying to diversify the same skill set then to look at offshore wind in terms of uh, how the, the, these skills are transferable across, as you can see, the offshore winds are already there. Uh, with the development of the new harbour, we're looking at um, also expanding um, um, other industries within Aberdeen and, and trying to move, not say move away, but to use the skills that is existing, the history that we've got and, and develop into other um, uh, economies. Uh, hydrogen is a huge step for us 
and we're still trying to be the forefront, forefront in terms of being an energy city in Scotland and we are developing heavily on and, and we're putting a lot of infrastructure in in terms of hydrogen. We secured a lot of European funding on that front and this is where we, it's almost like a parallel um, economy that we're running at the moment so that we are ready for that change in a transition that that happens because we don't want to be at a cliff edge where a lot of people suddenly have you know skills but they've got no jobs to go into so we were, we're ready for that and very quickly i touched on um the lhes which is the um, local heat energy efficiency strategy that we're pulling together within that is looking at how we've we've identified maybe an implementation plan so we're looking at improving insulation, installing district heating. We're looking at um, external wall insulations for our buildings. We're looking at insulation of heat pumps, removing air conditioning units into using air source heat pumps. That alone creates a market there that I think private sector or industry can look at. So once we package that, and that is the idea of the LHEs, is once we've identified these um, plans or, or projects, Suddenly, you come to a value, obviously, the cost to, de uh, to deliver these, but equally, there's a market opportunity there, in particular in the Northeast, where we do not have companies that are based in the Northeast to deliver a lot of these, um, let's say, uh, readily available up in the Northeast. Um, We're finding, um, when we tender out procurement-wise, it's still central Scotland that holds a lot of this energy efficiency skills. So there, again, is an opportunity in Aberdeen that we can have a training industry there that, you know, to encourage energy efficiency. So. That is the transition I can see in terms of, yes, oil and gas is there, but we need to understand that there are other markets that you know, have transferable skills, skills in particular energy efficiency and renewables. It's, it's, it's massive uh, opportunities there in hydrogen as well. So. Already with Aberdeen heat Correct. Charge, so yeah. it's about expanding what we do best, but equally, um, I think because we have that workforce and that skill set, and I think and it, it is very attractive then for inv investors because we have that there and it's established. So I, I think we, we, we feel that that is the way forward. Okay, okay we're going to have to move on. Mark Rusko. Um, thanks. One of the uh, private sectors that um, has perhaps struggled to reduce emissions is, is the services sector. Um, you know, I think there's only been a 6% reduction since 2009. Uh, and I'm just sort of wondering how, how that sector is, is innovating. Um, you've obviously got a lot of, you know, disruptive businesses in that area and um, perhaps where you see some of the, the reductions coming from. And, you know, I noticed earlier on, Tom, you, you, you said that, you know, business doesn't like regulation. I think I would have fallen off my seat if you'd, if you'd said that business did like regulation. But... Um, do you not see a kind of a, a way for the private sector and the service sector to innovate if business is regulated? And is there not a danger, perhaps, that those countries that are going down a stronger regulatory route or setting a higher ambition perhaps take the, the lead in terms of innovation, uh, particularly with their disruptors um, and innovative businesses, and that we're kind of left, left behind a bit? It, it certainly wasn't my intention to sort of say blanket business doesn't like regulation. I think, you know, there's good regulation and there's bad regulation. And some of the examples that I um, I wanted to talk about is, you know, drone technology being a great example of a disruptive technology, which is transforming you know, many disruptive businesses, has potential to transform multiple sectors, including energy gener generation, but that we don't have a regulatory approach in place which can enable businesses. The, the rules of the game aren't there, so businesses can innovate around it. Um, same with artificial intelligence, so you know, huge opportunities, particularly across the services sector there, but you know, things to do with the ethics of artificial intelligence, really complex regulatory questions which need both the private sector and the public sector's expertise to answer. You know, the quicker we can make progress with that, the better, and there's some great progress already make, taking place, for example. Yeah. Climate regulation, then. You're talking about regulatory frameworks that yep. govern more innovative technologies yeah. and freeing those up to compete. You're not, you're not talking about climate regulation or climate targets being a, a restrictor. Well, I think, I think, you know, actually having those targets in place is a useful thing. And actually, I think those being more clear cut by sector and milestones along the way to the long term targets is something that businesses um, would welcome. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's huge opportunities, particularly in this disruptive model, if there is um, more of a focus on the sort of facilitation around the innovation that comes with it, which I think was part of your question as well. Yeah. Okay, so what more should we be, should we be doing around um, facilitating innovation? 
So I think a lot of it comes to... This is technology to... we don't know about yet. I mean, this is stuff that the UK Climate Change Committee can't put into a, you know, an advice letter to the Scottish Government at the moment. Yeah, probably. and actually, you know, if you look in the power sector, for example, if you look at the cost of renewables, that's an example where innovation in that sector has brought down the cost far more than was actually anticipated. So just by... And that's without an overly regulatory approach um, from central government. It's with... Um, with uh, partnership from industry and particularly through establishing things like the carbon price and mm -hmm. CFD and electricity market reform. So there's great examples there of the things that we have achieved in terms of emission reductions which could be expanded out to the, the broader economy. I think that that could be seen as the low hanging, hanging fruit though. So, you know, that sector in particular perhaps is more engaged with discussions around emissions reductions and climate change than the wider economy is. Yeah. And actually, how do we how do we make this more of a um, sort of number one on the boardroom agenda rather than number three or four or five? So what are the sectors that need to catch up? Because we heard from the Swedish evidence last week, they've got 15 action plans, you know, quite a strong focus with their, their steel sector about how they position themselves globally. The cement sector is looking at all sorts of interesting technologies. Um, where do you see the resistance within the private sector or, or perhaps areas where you're showing uh, there are particular sectors that have huge you know, leadership around innovation? I think we've, we've got a gap in terms of uh, investment in energy efficiency in the private sector, particularly amongst small and medium-sized enterprises. I think we haven't had, you know, going back to the earlier conversation, we haven't had a consistent policy framework in that area for a long time. Um, and businesses aren't sure of the payoff. And when you're, you know, it's been very much easier to make a case for an investment in a new IT system or in higher wages for their staff than it has been on energy efficiency, frankly, because the business case just hasn't been there, um, or at least in the eyes of those who are sort of perceiving it, you know, whether it is or not. Um, so that's, that's one area. I think, obviously, transport is an area where there's going to be a huge amount of uh, demand and disruption um, for services over uh, the coming years and where there's a huge need to decarbonise. Um, and if you look at the transition to electric vehicles, that's something that could be a huge um, um, opportunity for the UK economy, given the manufacturing strength that we already have there. But you know, the supply chains for that sector gets... Um, decisions around the supply chain get set you know, years and years in advance. So you need to have the policy signals straight um, very early on. Um, and by those policy signals, I mean you need to create a market for the product. Um, if you look at the country with the highest take-up of electric vehicles, Norway, they also have the best consumer incentives for, for taking up those vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, And when those incentives were cut, hey presto, the, uh, the ownership of electric, the, the, the pace of uh, transition also dropped. So um, I don't think we've had that clear and consistent policy uh, incentives for the transition for electric vehicles, for example. But there's across industry, electric vehicles, buildings, there's examples like that where, you know, partnership between government and the private sector could yield quite rapid results. And one final question from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to go back to the financial memorandum. And at paragraphs 45, 46 and 47, it provides five scenario, scenarios each for the Scottish Government, local authorities, and then other bodies, individuals, or businesses. Um, but all it actually does is it takes the 13 billion, which we've talked about, whose origins are a mystery to me. And each scenario for each of them says it's 0%. 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100%. In other words, it's just an arithmetic distribution of the figures around these three sectors. I don't think it tells us anything. Is that a useful thing to have there? Should we have something that actually properly informs us what the view is? Or if, as this suggests to me, there isn't a view, uh, should it not be deleted from the financial memorandum? And of course, on the other side, uh, shouldn't we have uh, the economic opportunities? I mean, there's now 126,000 people employed in uh, renewables earning three billion a year, you know, which kind of gives a context to maybe the 13 billion is a trivially small number. Would anyone like to pick that up? Paul Gray. Thank you. Um, well, 
Mr Stevenson, as you will know, a civil servant is not going to comment on the uh, detail of a, a something uh, produced by the government. However, I will offer you a view, which is that scenarios are helpful. They may be wrong, but they are helpful because they allow you to test assumptions against what, you know, what might or might not be. And even if you say, well, that scenario is, is, is not going to happen, at least having tested it, you might come up with one that does. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I, I can certainly um, you know, provide the committee with some of the scenarios we have been thinking about, which uh, we have costed, with all the caveats I have uh, mentioned and proposed, which are to do with you know, today's technology is not tomorrow's technology. But um, I, think, I think it is important that, uh, as I think I said in response to Mr Scott, we at least have some sense of the scale of what it is we're looking at here. Um, if it, it, we, you know, we're, we're, we've discussed whether we ought to be aiming for 90% or 100% you know, in effect. Um, well, we, we, in a sense, what this is telling us is whichever one, one were to aim for, um, it, comes, it comes with an associated cost. You're right to say there may, there may well be as yet undefined um, associated opportunities. I think, I think it also prompts us to think very hard about the way we work together with the range of, um, not, you know, certainly the private sector, but also think about how we work with the third sector and academia to understand as, you know, as well as we possibly can, not just what the threats are, but what the opportunities are. So for, from my perspective, the fact that there is a financial memorandum and there is a, a set of scenarios, if it at least promotes conversation, that in itself is, is a worthwhile exercise. Um, clearly, if the committee wishes to ask for more, that's entirely at the hand of the committee. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the panel for giving us evidence. And we've kept you probably about a good 10, 15 minutes over the time allotted. So thank you very much for indulging us and uh, answering all our questions so comprehensively. At the next meeting on the 13th of November, the committee will continue its consideration of the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill. The committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of this meeting is now closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>